Hey, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. This is Griffin Gaming RPG, and thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me today uh, for another uh, Griffin Gaming RPG. <laughs> uh, no, actually, today we're back. Uh, today's Tuesday, and uh, we're going to continue with the uh, the viewing of Ten for the Chairman. Um, we started this last week. We went through episodes three, four, and five, and uh, this week we're going to kick it off again. Hey, Montoya, how the heck are you? Montoya Test, the Emperor of Test Squadron is here. I am truly, truly blessed to have you in my presence. Thank you very much for being here. Um, yeah, uh, as you guys know, um, I started this idea of going back and reviewing the Ten for the Cherubin. And you say, why, Griff? Why? That's old stuff. Yes, it is. It's very old. In fact, most of the stuff goes back to 2013, 2014. I think maybe even a little bit of 20. No, maybe just 2013 and 14. Um, but the reason why I'm going over this is because uh, this is the groundwork or the vision that Chris Roberts, uh, or the show that he used to express his vision and groundwork for what would become Star Citizen and Squadron 42. And um, over the years, uh, there are a lot of people who've been around and they kind of know all the story and they kind of know the direction of the development. But there are a lot of people who came on board in 2016, 2018, 2020, who never really heard many of these episodes. And so quite often when I'm uh, playing with other people and whether it's looking in chat or whether it's in discord and people often raise questions and ask why are things a certain way or they'll talk about what they would like to see in the game. Um, they don't realize that many of those things and suggestions and ideas that they have quite often have already been outlined. Chris Roberts has taken time to take questions from the community, uh, which is what Tin for the chairman was. Uh, I think if you were a subscriber, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, you were able to submit a question uh, and they, they would pick from these questions and Chris would take 10 of those questions and respond to them answering questions from the community. So quite often when people will ask questions about um, about permadeath or they'll talk about uh, aliens or ships or whatever the case may be, quite often those questions have already been asked and already been answered. And so the idea is to be able to um, you know, be able to hear what Chris had to say. Now, let me put in a couple of waivers here. One of the waivers is, is that quite often the information uh, may be old, may be dated, may have changed. So I always want to keep that in mind. Uh, Disco always throws out this statement about um, change is something that happens in development and it does. And, but you know, it's, it's one thing to change things and it's another thing to sometimes drop things. And I think a lot of times what we've seen is CIG has morphed ideas or they've they've evolved into something else. Uh, it hasn't been too many times where I think to see totally dropped. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, mind you. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen because there are some ideas that get floated out there that ultimately don't go anywhere, right? <clears throat> That's a part of the development process. It's a part of the testing process. And I think one of the things that I've seen happen a lot is things will come into the PTU or into the live servers, the universe, people see it, they get used to it. And there's automatically a conscious or subconscious feeling that, oh, this is what's going to be in the game later. But the reality is, is that we are still in a testing environment, whether it's in the PTU or whether it's in the live, we're still in the development process. And so there may be some things that come out there that work. Um, some of you remember the early flight models, people were really enjoying the early flight models. And then they thought let's do something a little different. And they did hover mode, uh, which was a different type of flight model that didn't work. Um, and of course the community responded by saying, Hey, this ain't working. Um, some people got used to it. I eventually got used to it. Other people never got used to it. Uh, CIG eventually went back, revamped it and changed it. And we went to a, a different flight model, which was not the old one, but it was, it was better than what we had. It was pretty good. And now we're getting ready to approach another period where they're getting ready to do into this whole thing with a new flight mode that they're going to have called master modes. And so once again, we're going to be testing the waters and seeing whether or not this new flight mode really achieves both what Chris wants and what the community enjoys. If it doesn't, it'll go back to the drawing board. So this whole process is all about trying things out, seeing how the community responds to it, seeing whether it fits within the framework of what Chris wants for his vision. And then hopefully there's something where we meet in the middle for all of that. So hopefully that's the case. Um, hey, prisoner, good to see you. Throw something <laughs> yeah, against the wall and see if it sticks. Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of this is. And unfortunately, 
you know, gamers come to a game wanting to play a game. They don't necessarily come to a game wanting to test a game. Uh, they really, and especially if it's something they like, you know, if they like it, their attitude is, hey, I like it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But a lot of times there are things that are broke. So anyway, without further ado, uh, when is the last time we had a tape for the chairman? About eight years ago, I think it was, i tell you, at least. Um, so let's go ahead and get this kicked off. Uh, usually we knock out three episodes of this because they're only usually about anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes long. Um, I will be stopping from time to time to give my commentary. Uh, don't forget, if you want to come in and share your thoughts about what we're watching too, you can click on the link that's in my on my page for Discord. It'll bring you to a queue and you can get to share your thoughts about what Chris is talking about or maybe maybe something I've said if you don't agree with it or you do agree with it. Um, but there'll be our time to do that during this show. So let's go ahead and get ready to do that. Let's um, change screens here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and kick things off with Chris. All right. Where's my mouse? It's on the other screen. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, 10 for the chairman. For those of you who haven't seen this show yet, this is where I take 10 questions from uh, the subscribers uh, and uh, answer them. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's go ahead and answer the first question uh, from Amra Khan. Uh, and Amra Khan asks, with the new YouTube copyright issued uh, with companies redacting videos or claiming them as their own, will you allow videos of Star Citizen? Um, so the simple answer is yes. I mean, we, we're actually quite excited when everyone's sharing videos of Star Citizen. It was really cool to watch everyone show off their hangar and how the different ships looked and kind of the fun and shenanigans they got up to. Uh, so we're sort of in favor of uh, you guys sharing gameplay, hangar videos, whatever, whatever it would be as far as that. So uh, we'll be trying our best to uh, not tell YouTube to, uh, to uh, block the content. Um, okay, next question. Let me stop there. Um, it, you know, this kind of seems like a, a moot thing at this point because we've been living with it for so long, but there was a, a period of time where some game companies did not necessarily like you sharing their information, particularly if you were critical. Um, and CIG kind of kept their policy open that they would let the backers be able to make YouTube videos and share both the good and the bad. Some of you may even remember back in the day, tremendous amount of the videos were really about the glitches and how the game did not run well. And um, I don't know, maybe you can share your thoughts in chat or if you guys want to come in and talk to me about it. Do you think that, do you think that CIG, uh, wow, thank you, prisoner, for the bits. Thanks for the 100 bits. Appreciate that. Um, do you guys think that CIG having that policy about allowing backers to show the game off was a good thing? Do you think it was good in the beginning? You know, when it showed all of its warts and everything else? Uh, do you think they should have waited? Um, and what are your feelings about content creators in general being able to, I don't know, is a, there's a weird thing about content creators, right? There are some people who look at content creators as being um, the way to get additional information about CIG stuff because maybe they do a little bit more in-depth reading and the homework. People like Board Gamer, uh, 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 Super Mac Brothers, these guys, they go in and do like a whole detailed thing, Space Tomato. They'll do like a really detailed breakdown. They'll read monthly reports, the newsletters and things like that. And a lot of people get their information that way. But then there's another group of people who think that the content creators are either think they are or are a privileged group of people, right? That uh, in some way or other, maybe they have greater access or maybe they get things that other people don't get uh, or they think the content creators are full of themselves. I don't know. I'm a content creator, so I don't know. But I'm I'm curious to know what you guys think, um, uh, you know, about them having this open policy, because to a certain degree, Content creators have been the marketing and advertising for this game. CIG really, uh, for many years, well, this is year 12, so this is like 13. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, year 11. So for probably nine of those years, well, I'm not going to say that because that's not really a good way to look at it. I guess it all depends on how you look at when they put out trailers, right? Because I've always viewed trailers as being their marketing to us, the community where some people have looked at the trailers as being advertising to the gaming community in general. Uh, and the reason why I, I never looked at it that way is because it, 
first of all, it was the idea of selling ships, right? Not selling the, well, maybe it was trying to sell the game, but most of the time, like if it was the, if it was the Vulture commercial, it was about the Vulture. If it was the Connie, it was about the Connie. Um, so I'm not saying that it didn't impact outside of our community, but I just kind of feel like a lot of it was directed toward us. Now, later on, especially when 318 came out, and even before that, I think even 317, CIG did start putting out uh, commercials uh, that were, uh, well, actually it was back in 314, they started putting out these patch commercials. Before it was just ship commercials. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. When it was the ship commercials, I felt like that was marketed to us. When they started putting out update commercials, like update 3.17 is playable now, that's when it started to seem like it was not only us, but maybe creeping out into the, the gaming industry. And of course, we know when 318 came out, uh, there was a lot of pushback on that. Um, so what I, to my point, I don't want to get on a big thing about when stuff goes out, but I do want to say this. For many years, it's been the content creators and the people who've made YouTube videos who are the ones who are pretty much letting people know about Star Citizen not as much as CIG. CIG didn't have a really big marketing campaign per se. They do have money set aside for that. But uh, anyway, to be fair, some of the content creators have more access with devs. Oh, board, Paul. Yeah. And some of that has come from Prisoner, the fact that they've actually met these people, which is one of the reasons why I've encouraged people to, if you can go to a, um, a, a citizen con, to go. Uh, it's not that they had a phone number or anything like that, but it is the fact that when you go to the bar citizen, or when you go to the citizen con, you get to talk to these people one-on-one -on -one and you get to know who they are and you do get to connect with them. Uh, and for some people, they've been fortunate enough to have people come on their show. Um, some of you may remember in the early, early days, uh, Ben Lesnick would come on shows. Disco, a lot of the guys would come on to different content creators shows. Eventually CIG had to pull back on that. Uh, and for a variety of reasons. Uh, but eventually what they did was they created the community um the community managers. And so usually then it started moving more to people like Zylo um, and people like that, Galactica, people like that who would start showing up on shows uh, because the community, the community managers were in a better position to speak on behalf. They're the buffer, right? Between the company and the, and us. And they're the ones who can speak to what needs to be said about the game project. The devs quite often, you know, they have to be very careful about what they say. You know, they have, there's only so much they can say as well. Yeah. I know you're best friends with Chris Rowe. Chris Roberts, Montoya. I know you call him and speak to him every day. Kevion, good to see you. How are you? Uh, yeah. So anyway, let's go on and get to the next question here. I want to belabor that point. Uh, it's from Professor, um, who asked, will the insurance premium go up the more you lose your ship? Um, so that's a pretty good question. We haven't fully balanced that sort of stuff yet. We've had discussions about, obviously, if someone's constantly losing their ship or doing dumb things like ramming into other people, then there should be a penalty because that would happen in the real world. Uh, and you don't want to encourage bad behavior. You just don't want to punish someone for being unlucky and having to get attacked by, you know, you know, whether it's NPCs or players, it's still you've lost your ship, right? So uh, we still have to balance that. But I would th say that the general idea is if there is sort of like uh, a sniff of something like insurance fraud or um, sort of bad behavior, then maybe the insurance premium would go up to sort of dissuade you from like doing things like using your ship as a ramming, uh, as a weapon in, 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 in dogfighting. Um, so, but not fully, de not fully decided that will be a balanced thing that we'll, we'll tune as we go along. Okay. Okay. There's a good one, right? About insurance. Cause people have always asked this question, does LTI mean anything insurance? First of all, LTI is nice. It's nice to have you, right now in the game. Uh, and it's, it doesn't really do anything in the game right now, right? Um, but LTI's idea is that whenever it's a limited uh, lifetime insurance, something happens to your ship, you get your ship back. Um, <clears throat> uh, when is this q and A? I, I, nobody, this was from uh, January of 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, these go back. I opened up the show talking about this is Chris from the show 10 from the chairman, where he, community people could ask questions and uh, he would respond to them. So that's where these questions are coming from. Um, the LTI thing, again, is designed so that if your ship gets destroyed for some reason, and it's really cool to talk about this for a hot second. <clears throat> if your ship gets destroyed, your insurance company replaces it. Now, there's a lot of variables that CIG has talked about over the years, and I'm going to share some of them with you. I'm not saying these are locked down. I am saying these are the things that they've talked about that could be impactful to when your ship gets lost. First of all, Chris has made it very clear that ship loss is going to be something 
that that it takes a lot to make happen. He does not want ships like right now we've gotten used to this. And this is when this whole thing comes down to what we get used to happening versus what should happen in the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hook 2005. Thank you so much for that follow. Appreciate that. OK, so let's talk about this LTI thing. OK, OK. Ships, Chris says he wants ships to be disabled more than destroyed. Now, it's not that a ship cannot be destroyed, but he says it's going to take a lot to destroy a ship. Now, what he means by that is not a lot of bombs, but it does mean, of course, my alarm is going off because my wife opened the door. So let me shut that off, guys. Give me one second. <laughs> I know you guys can hear that. Um, turn that off. Boom. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so. The idea is, is that it's going to take a lot in the, and, I, and he inferred that it means it's going to take a lot of time. Now, right now we get used to two or three missiles or some gunning and boom, a ship blows up. It's not the way it's going to happen later on. Uh, the idea is that a ship will be disabled. In fact, the idea is that when we go after ships, our idea is to disable them, targeting systems on the ship, the, the you know, the quantum drives or the hyperdrives or the shields, things of that nature with the idea that one, we're gonna do more of a piracy thing more than destruction. Now, mind you, obviously in a dogfighting scenario, we're talking about something entirely different. But even then, even in those cases, the idea is that you will damage a ship to a point where it's disabled. Now, why is that important? Because it creates other game mechanics, such as the repair mechanic, right? Being able to tow ships with ships like the SRV. Uh, there will be a lot of people that use the crucible or being able to use other, even the manual aspects of going out with your, your multi-tool and being able to repair the wings of your ship. All that has happened, if your ship just gets blown up, then all of that aspect of the gameplay goes out of the window, okay? So they want disabling to happen first. And they, what they haven't said is, we always think about insurance in relation to replacing a ship, but they haven't talked about it in relation to repairing a ship. So does that mean that if your ship is towed into a location, I would think that insurance also, like when your car is in an accident, there would be a repair mechanic aspect that you pay for. So let's first of all deal with that, okay? That they don't want destruction per se. If it is destroyed, if your ship is obliterated, then they've talked about the fact that you will get a base model of your ship. Now that's, the, I'm, I'm not stopping there. There's more to that. You get the base model of the ship. They also said that there could be a factor where time is related to that. For example, I'm an origin guy. I like origin. Origin is based in Terra. I happen to be in Stanton. If for some reason my ship gets destroyed, it's not like my ship will instantaneously come from Terra to where I am in Stanton. They're, they've talked they've talked about the fact that there may be a process of time, either by delivery in PC, or I have to go there and get it. Maybe there's a manufacturing aspect. Maybe if Terra, for example, is low on certain resources and their production on ships is not moving as fast, maybe it may take a little more time for me to get that ship because it literally an 890 jump is not just laying around in the showroom. It's got to be manufactured. So there may be time in relation to when my 890 jump will be available for me to pick up. Okay. Then they've also said manufacturing time is going to be a deal too. If your ship gets destroyed, it may, let's say you've got a Kraken. Krakens aren't laying around in the showroom. It may take you a, three days, a week maybe two weeks before you get your Kraken back because of the scale of the ship and the ship has to be built out. There's a lot tied into this thing about LTI. And even then, when you get it back, you get the base model. Now, let's speak beyond that. They also talked about being able to buy insurance to insure things on your ship, insure the additional components, insure the weapons, insure cargo, things of that nature. If you notice in the hospitals, there is actually an insurance station where you can go to to pay for different types of insurance. The same type of thing is going to happen when it comes to your ships. You'll be able to have different, and you can choose, like people do in real life. Opt into the insurance, opt out of the insurance. But you may decide to say, yeah, it's worth me paying this money. Uh, if it's someone else who's got you hauling, maybe they pay you for the insurance to cover it. Or if it's your stuff, maybe you're going to pay the coverage. But anyway... My point is, like Chris said, there's a lot that they're thinking about in relation to this thing with replacing ships, LTI, insurance components, all that stuff. It's going to make the gameplay much more complicated. Right now, LTI means absolutely nothing other than when you want to move up and buying a better ship. But later on, LTI will at least get you a base ship. Now, what happens if you don't have LTI? And then we're going to move on. If you don't have LTI, you can still pay for insurance on your ships. He said you'll make like a monthly payment or something like that. 
if you want your ship insured. So it's not that you can't have insurance, you'll just pay out of pocket versus people who pay for LTI. That's the difference in that, okay? Uh, I talked a lot. Let's see what people say. Um, uh, I usually see you responding from YouTube. Okay, Dre, so say, also, if the ship isn't totally destroyed, the insurance company might generate a mission. There you go to salvage and recover and repair the ship. Yes, absolutely, prisoner. They also, <clears throat> excuse me. They also talked about recovery was a factor. Um, there was something else that they said about that you touched on. I was going to say it was totally destroyed. The insurance company generate a mission. There was something else I was going to say about ship destruction, and I've forgotten what it was now. Can you hire a player to repair your disabled ship completely so you can avoid increased insurance premiums? Kavion, I think the answer to that is going to be yes. Um, there are one of the reasons why the Crucible is out there is that the Crucible is going to, if you can't get your ship into some place, the Crucible being a mobile, fully functioning repair platform can come out and repair your ship. Um, Crucible owners will, and you know, once again, when they show up, I'm sure they're going to be certain core supplies they need in order to fix a ship. <clears throat> so repairing them is going to be not only for their labor to repair your ship, <clears throat> but the resources that they're going to charge you for what it took to repair your ship. If you've got a smaller fighter, resources are going to be a certain amount. If you've got a larger ship like a Retaliator or a Starfare, obviously it's going to cost a little bit more. But there will be gameplay for that. Some of you remember that we used to have Cry Astro stations in the game. These were locations where you did repair, refuel, and restocking. They took them out. They were in the game for quite a while. People, that's where you used to have to go to refuel, in fact. Uh, but those are going to come back. Cryostro stations are going to come back. So those will be locations where also your ships can be taken to. Okay. Uh, I thought the Crucible could only repair small ships, light fighters. No, the Crucible actually can repair. They've showed this, <clears throat> that you can use multiple Crucibles to fix larger ships. There's the platform inside <clears throat> the bay that does hold fighter-sized ships. But what it also can do, it has arms that work within that bay, but then they have arms that also extend out. There's a great video done by Star Jump uh, Grimm from Star Jump Station. Check out his great video on the Crucible. There's a full breakdown on it. Talks about the fact that you could have multiple of these things working on the larger ships to repair them if necessary. But again, that's a mobile means to do it, right? And there may be reasons why, you you know, if your ship is in deep, deep space somewhere uh, and it's disabled, you know, maybe there is no cryastro station. Maybe the idea of towing it just isn't there. Maybe it's a better idea to have hire two crucibles to come out. If you're in an org, obviously maybe two or three crucibles you got that will come out and repair your Polaris, you know, repair your, um, your, um, Carrick, right? The larger scale ships. We don't know what that looks like yet. The repair mechanic is nowhere near defined in any means other than what we've seen with the multi-tool. And that's just to do skins. But when there's structure damage, things of that nature, the idea is that ships like that are capable to be able to help you out. So we'll see. Uh, let's see. Otherwise you might have to go to cousin crows. Yeah. Cousin crows is another place. Cousin crows does repairs. There are also modifications too. And that's, I've also kind of been curious about how that's going to work out with them. They're, they're known for their custom work, right? For doing things like paint jobs and, and modifications to ships. Not that they don't do repairs, you know? Um, but you know, we'll have to see how they, in the lore, how they set up cryastro stations versus the, uh, crucible crucible has got to be important in the game. You know what I mean? Because if everybody can just go to a repair shop and I would think that it seems like CIG is trying to do a thing where whatever we do as players gains more value than when it's NPC based, right? That it's better. So it's maybe better for you to get fuel from someone in a star fair than it is from a station, right? Unless they're just kind of super jacking their prices up. Right. Uh, but it seems like they always want the players to be the ones who are engaging in, even though in the NPCs are a fallback. There, there is the backup. When there's no players around, will there be an NPC that responds? Yes, there'll be a way that you could do it via NPC. But they really want players to rely on players a lot in the game. Okay? Stan Gun, thank you so much for that file. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's keep going here. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, the next question is from Mei Lin, who asks, how will we be able to disengage from combat? Will it always require us to have a faster ship than our adversaries, or will there be other ways to evade them? Um, again, that's another good question, uh, and that's a, that's a balanced thing. So uh, uh, having 100% figured out, um, would it always just be about uh, outrunning, or would there be other ways? I mean, we're certainly going to allow you to 
uh, control sort of your radar image uh, in terms of like how hot or um, quiet you are basically. And so there potentially could be, depending on the situation and the environment, there definitely could be places where you could essentially say hide behind an asteroid field and really turn all your systems off and then you'd have almost no radar profile and then you would sort of go off people's scopes and then they could potentially pass along. So that would be one way to get out of it. And then of course if you had uh, a faster ship, um, then potentially go, uh, you could get away too. And, and we're kind of thinking of some dynamics that would sort of fall into the whole sort of um, uh, rationale behind, you know, whether when we cap the velocity at the low speeds, but we still allow you to reach much higher speeds, obviously, when you're traveling between, um, say, nav points in space, because um, in those cases, you're just accelerating in a straight line or not. So uh, haven't, um, fully figured all that out, but we're going to try and come up with some good ways, but also have it a way so you can't always run away from combat because that wouldn't be that much fun uh, for a bunch of other people. So uh, again, a balanced thing. Okay. Okay. So for those of you out there who, whether you're a fighter pilot or whether you're just a cargo person, this is an important question. When it comes down to, you know, combat or you know, you're being attacked or whatever, uh, they, and, and, and we kind of see this already in the game, right? Those of us who've been around any length of time, we remember the days of jousting when everything was super fast. We were flying everywhere. Nobody was hitting anybody to when CIG came out with SCM and dropped us down to a combat speed where you have to drop to a certain speed to be able to do certain things. And we know CIG is still tweaking that. They really want, and I know it, it, it's a wrestling between what we've watched in movies like Star Wars, right? You watch Star Wars and you see X-Wings and TIE Fighters going at it and they're at these super fast speeds. Uh, you remember the whole thing with uh, Anakin Skywalker when he was a kid and he was in the, the Naboo Starfighter. I mean, those are the, the speed at which they're moving is almost, un, you know, is, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, right? Uh, where they're targeting and fighting people. That's great on cinema and film and it looks great and it's exciting. But in reality, when we look at fighting, there is a certain aspect of speed that is much more realistic. Chris wants us to be able to be in close quarter combat. So, you know, this, being able to, to fight and you can't even see the, the, pardon the expression, the whites of their eyes, right? If you can't even do that, he really wants us to be up close and tight. He wants us to be able to focus in on shutting down ships and disabling, targeting certain systems, things of that nature, versus just blind shooting and hitting a ship anywhere. Now, sometimes that's what you got to do, right? You're trying to survive. But I do like the fact that he's talked about some of the other mechanics that you can use or tactics you can use. Maybe if you're not a great pilot, there are the things of lowering your signal, uh, evading, fighting like that. I, recently, I, I, I shared the story before, I was pirated about a month ago in a C2. And it took the guy about 20, I, I set a timer, it took about 20 minutes for him to finally disable me. And this was in a C2. This guy was in a Cutlass Blue and he was on me for a long time. I'm not a great fighter pilot. I'm not, especially in a C2 leaving atmosphere. But I was able to break atmosphere. I was able to get out into space finally. I was able to evade him for a long period of time. He shut me down twice. He hit me twice with the, um, the uh, what do you call it? You know what it's about. He disabled my power a couple times. But then he finally did get to finally shut me down after 20 minutes. And it was great. It was an engaging period of cat and mouse and chasing. I lost my stuff, but I had a great time. And I do want that. Uh, was I trying to escape? Absolutely. But he, he, he shut down so that I couldn't do any quantum jumps. And so I had to fall back. Couldn't, couldn't do the quantum jumps. So now I've got to fall back to tactics, right? Uh, but I was by myself. Would it have been great to have had a co-pilot in the ship with me who was handling my signature, my profile, maybe minimizing it as big as a C2 is? I know that's hard to do, but if you're in a smaller ship, uh, yeah, you could have someone who's doing that. Or even if I was capable enough to have had my keys programmed out a little bit better and more familiar with them, where I could have changed them from some things, you know, added greater shield power, which I did do, but I could have changed some other things around and maybe would have helped me even more. So I like the fact that it's not just going to be about having a faster ship. You know, that's that's not what they want it to be. In some cases, speed will help you, but we'll see. We have this new master modes thing coming up. We'll see how that all pans out. Let's keep going here. Let me see what else folks say. Hey, Gladestone. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, yeah, hoping they don't have a mantis. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. First time chattered. Yeah, Hook, there you go. Having a red player should be fine, in my opinion. If you're in a vulture or other industry ship, ramming is the only real chance other than fleeing. Yeah, <clears throat> here's your pro and con to ramming hook, and I, I get it. Because it's kind of like that, you know, that, you know, that final thing that you do at the end when you know there's no hope, there's nothing else you can do, you've done all you can do, right? Um, let's talk about what happens in any form of self-destruction, right? Um, 
we were talking about insurance earlier. CIG said, that, and the question was, well, well, can, how can you impact insurance or can you nullify it? And CIG has said this, if they see a pattern of misuse uh, where every situation is something happens, like let's say I'm a, a, a whole sea pilot and every time I get pirated, I just blow the ship up. You know, my like, ain't none of you, nobody, we're all going out of here. If there's a pattern of that, now I'm sure they can use algorithms and other things to determine this. Your insurance may either get dropped or go up. Now, for some people, they may be willing to take that risk and say, I'm willing to pay more money. Uh, some other people may be not willing or, you know, they say we're not going to insure you for the next 30 days because of this pattern. And CIG has said this, they, they're going to track this type of thing. Right. Uh, and don't forget, don't be fooled. Their logistics, they can tell the systems can tell whether you've rammed somebody. If you do it once, probably not a big deal. Right. Ramming happens by accident. But if they see a pattern of ramming, you got to be willing to say, am I willing to have my insurance not lose it forever? But maybe not available. The next time I take this ship out, uh, my ship isn't insured now because I decided to do that particular tactic too many times. So um, it is a gameplay mechanic. I think you, I think it can be a gameplay mechanic to do that if push comes to shove uh, out of desperation. Uh, but if it's something that someone just falls back on as their pattern, I would say they may have to be careful with that. You know, um, yeah. In World War II, warships would rub sub submarines. Yeah, but but that's also because if they hit a submarine, the warship usually survived and the sub didn't. So that's the difference too. Now, mind you, remember what I said earlier too. Ramming a ship does not necessarily mean destruction. They do want the ships to remain persistent. So what you may do is disable them, but you also may disable yourself at the same time. Now that may not be a bad thing. Maybe now you've evened the scales, right? So maybe both ships are disabled. You know, you've hit them so bad that their engines have gone out, but you've also lost the, the possibility of being able to quantum or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of scenarios that can happen uh, in the, in that particular case, right? Uh, and maybe if, as long as there's not destruction, you know, I, I don't know. We'll have to see. CIG, it's an open thing. CIG is going to come up with some stuff, right? But imagine with larger ships like a Kraken, have a few ramming ships pushing the nose around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty funny. All right, let's see the next question here. Next question uh, is from uh, Big Bad Abum. <laughs> Big Bad Dom. Big Bad Bum. Next question is from Big Bad Abum. And Big Bad Abum asks How will in game ship bang and selling work in Star Citizen? In the good old Wing Commander privateer game, I had to search the verse for different traders and compare the available offers. I could imagine in Star Citizen, that it would be the same, but with more details like negotiate prices, options, organized transports, etc. Um, so definitely uh, in Star Citizen, I kind of want the sort of buying and selling to be a immersive. So you walk into a showroom and there's a there's actually an NPC sales guy there, and he's telling you why you should really be stepping up to this particular model, uh, 300i spaceship, um, and sort of make it feel like you would be buying something in the real world. On top of that. Um, so there'll be some, you know, we'll have some idea for negotiating prices, make it fun. Um, and also I kind of want to make the gameplay be very focused around forcing you as a player to adventure around the universe. So for instance, you shouldn't be able to go to every space, every planet and buy exactly the same ships on every planet. So I want you to be able to go from one corner of the galaxy because this is the place they make the best dogfighter and the other side of the galaxy is the place they make the best information runner. And, and so you sort of go around and adventure around to buy different equipment and different ships. So you make the trek to go to this one corner in the universe where the guy is the best gunsmith ever and he can increase the range of your um, you know, long range ballistic weapon by 20%. And so the idea would be you would sort of fly around the galaxy and cover obviously a lot of light years, um, trying to make sure that you've got the best weapon or the ship you want and all the rest of the stuff. So I think it will it will be more so than private team, more so than freelancer. I think it will work quite well. Um, okay. Next. Okay. So we've already seen this in the game. Uh, you guys already know that the different ship dealers uh, sell different ships. Uh, you can't get everything everywhere, <clears throat> but you also hold him, heard him reference even weapons. And I know that was a big deal back in the day. People were so used to getting most of their weapons at a certain place and then CIG implemented the thing where they scattered weapons, right? 
Certain weapons can only be bought at certain places and even sold at certain places. You get more money than others. So this is already being implemented in the game. Nothing new, but it is new for some people. Uh, if you're around back in the day, you remember it was so easy to go to one shop and almost everything was there. I remember when they first implemented it, <clears throat> they moved certain weapons and armors from Port O, where we all used to start out out, to Grimhex. Then they, they split them up. It was like the more unlawful looking armor and weapons you could find at Grimhex and the more lawful, uh, you know, cleaner stuff you could find at Port O. But now that's been scattered even out to the different um, uh, locations throughout the system, right? And we know that's what they're going to do. All right, let's keep it going here. Next question is from Malcolm Kodiak Knight, who asks, have you given any thoughts to how in-depth the banking account system in the Persistent Universe will be, and how will it be tied to the org system? Um, <clears throat> so we're still on the early stages of um, sort of the whole banking account system, but one of the points of the organization is to allow an organization, a group of people, to be able to sort of manage joint finances. So you'll be able to charge the members of your guild or organization membership fees. Uh, you'll be able to have a pooled account that you could buy things or buy real estate or do stuff that would uh, be able to shared by the organization and owned by the organization. Um, <coughs> so I would think that um, you know we would try to probably push the banking account system um, to be fairly sophisticated. You know, not too different than what you get in the the real world. I don't know if we're going to have a stock market to the extent that you would potentially have a stock market here in the real world, but we would probably have something that would be fairly similar as well. Um, okay, next question. Okay, so the banking system, you guys know we ended up getting the the e-money changer thing that comes up now in our apps. We didn't have that for a very long time. <clears throat> there was really no way for us to pass money between each other as players. Um, CIG finally implemented that. People were very happy about that because when they would do certain missions and groups, they could now pay money to each other, which was great. Uh, we had some workarounds in the early days with beacons. <laughs> that was another way of doing it. But eventually they did implement that. But uh, the question was also about organizations and whether there'll be org banks uh, where everyone can have a communal pot within an organization. You guys know there are plenty of games that have that. And we know that CIG says that they do want to implement something like that. Of course, there's security measures and all the other things you have to come up with for it. Uh, but I, I am looking forward to that. I'm hoping that CIG moves forward a little bit more with how we handle not just money, but inventory too. I want to be able to be talking to a player, look at them and click and I can trade with them. Uh, I don't want to have to lay stuff on the ground and all that other stuff. We do have some common areas and ships where you can place things in certain common storage areas where if I put it in this certain shelf, like on the, some of you guys know on the, um, the uh, Anvil Pisces C8R, the rescue, uh, it has a couple of bins in there. One of them is a crew bin. And if you place the guns in there, someone else can go in there and take the guns out. Uh, on the C2, when you first come up the elevator, there are common bins there that you can use that everybody can share. Not every ship has that though. Eventually we know that's gonna come. Uh, but when it comes to the banking aspect and being able to transact monies and move monies from here to there, we do wanna see something a little bit more in depth, especially for trading. People wanna get into this whole thing of trading, all seas coming in, cargo, stuff like that. We wanna be able to have a dynamic economy and eventually it's gonna get here. Question comes from Daduk Fish, who asks, will there be a way to improve efficiencies with equipment, jobs, tasks, and general actions within the game? In essence, will there be a leveling up system where we can improve our ability to mine resources, haggle prices, fast travel, detect other ships, etc., through man hours, uh, in brackets, experience, to unlock new equipment areas and quest submissions? Um, so it's kind of a two-part answer because uh, you know, this is not a traditional MMO. There is no leveling. It's not like you start at level one and you'll work your way up to level 20. Um, so a lot of it is to do with your own skill set. But then again, the equipment and things that you've, you've got um, help you in doing these jobs and tasks. So I think, you know, doing things like being a better miner will involve uh, going and mining, doing it, sort of learning the skill, so to speak, yourself, actually doing it, not not learning it as in I've gone from level one minor to level five minor, uh, and having the right equipment. So you'll have to buy the equipment, upgrade your equipment, um, uh, you know, maybe go to some specialty place that does you know, really 10% you know, better equipment, 20% better equipment. So it's a combination of your actual player skills, uh, you as a person, and then also the equipment you're using will sort of be our version of leveling up. There'll be some stuff where like perhaps you wouldn't be able to operate certain 
uh, items or equipment without the right license and you'd have to maybe do some kind of like a driving test, right? So like in today's world, you can't just drive an 18-wheeler truck. You have to have a license to do that. So we may have something like that. But in general, uh, the leveling and tasks will be sort of a more real-world base, i.e. based on your skill and the equipment you're using, not based on an arbitrary sort of role-playing level. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So next question. Hey, let me stop there. No skills, even though they just talked about recently introducing this idea. There's no skill tree. Let me say it that way. Um, most of us, though, in our MMOs and stuff, we get to level 50, level 75, level 100. That's how we show our progress in the game. Um, CIG is introducing this dynamic about skills, though, with some other areas. And I'm curious to see where this is going to go. Because they've talked about being able to do certain things physically, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit faster than other players. I'm going to really be interested to see where they go with that, because I know there's a fine line <clears throat> in relation to that. Um, the aspect he talked about, about will things be able to be improved? You know, we get better by the more we play the game. I mean, literally, by the more we play the game. Uh, our knowledge base of the game gets better. Our understanding of the game gets better. The more you know of the lore, the more the game gets better. The more you do things, it gets better. It has nothing to do with any technical mechanics that are built into the game. We give you the ship, we give you the tools. The more you do it, you get better. That's basically how it works out. You want to be a good fighter pilot. It's not because you get a better or faster ship. It's because you learn how to use that better or faster ship or even a slower ship. One guy, a good friend of mine, Cal Roddy. Cal Roddy goes out and does nine tails and slaughters both NPCs and people in the Aurora LN. That's his ship. He deliberately has chosen to say, I'm going to show that I can do this in an Aurora LN. And there are other people who could care less about an LN. All they want to worry about is flying in a, a this or a, a that, a Gladius or whatever, a arrow. This guy's in a freaking Aurora LN blowing everybody out of the sky. He even goes after the freaking Idris in the thing. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? So this is really about you being able to use the tools and mastering those tools in the game. Now, things with the components and stuff, he says, yeah, you'll be able to have different Things that you can do we know they're going to be able to uh tweak certain things crafting there are other things that are becoming in the game that you can uh, make things better uh but that again is going to be based upon you having the resources the information knowing how to do it where to go blah 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 blah. it's not about because you've reached level 15 you can now make a so-and-so uh maybe you can't make a so-and-so just because you never did it before and now you know what resources there are and maybe you get to tweak it and make it better if you follow down a certain way of doing it or, you know, certain, you know, crafting ingredients, whatever the case may be. But, uh, yeah, that's going to be the deal with how do we get good in the game, okay? And it's not just because of a skill tree. It is from uh, Superluminal, and Superluminal asks, what happens if I fail during oh, the first transit of a jump point? Let me stop uh, something like here. There was other thing that I want to touch on. Um, let me go back, and I'll go back and hit the question again, too, so you don't, we don't miss it. He said that there are going to be certain things that you have to actually like prepare to do to get licensed. I don't know if you guys know this, but with the, the in the lore, in the lore now, and they've been pretty good about staying pretty close to the lore. And this is the example he's referring to with the Genesis Starliner. In order to fly the Genesis Starliner in UEE space, you have to be licensed. You actually have to submit a perm to get a permit to do it you can't just fly it around and pick up now you can fly it around if you want to but you cannot move people around you cannot transport npcs around in it and players so they actually and i guess if you do and they catch you you'll get a fine or something good won't happen to you i don't know but they made it very clear that ships like that maybe the same thing happens with a ship like um maybe moving the hulls I mean, not to be funny, he used the example of 18 wheelers, how these people just can't go out and, and fly around. Maybe later on in the game to transport certain materials, hazardous materials, you will have to have a permit. You'll have to be licensed in UEE space to do it. Now, if you're outside of that, you could be renegade and do whatever you want to. But maybe if it's in UEE space, you've got to be certified. We don't know. But he used those as examples. And, and again, the Lord does say that for like the Starliner, you got to have a permit to be able to do that. So it's going to be interesting to see. You guys know right now, even when you do certain missions like mercenary missions and stuff, you have to get a permit. You got to start out with a permit. You got to be like, first, you can't get the big missions first. You got to start out, get the permit. And then after that, you can start getting certain missions. And maybe it'll be the same way with this. If you want to pick up passengers and NPCs and make money, since you're not relying on players, you got to get a permit first before you go to a spaceport 
you can go to the spaceport, but maybe nobody boards your ship. Maybe no NPCs take you up to go somewhere because you do not have a person permit and you're not licensed to do it. So there's a lot of ways they can make that happen in the game. Okay. All right, let's do this next question. During the first transit of a jump point, uh, seems like a quick way to an empty casket. Um, so, uh, well, if you were charting the jump point for the very first time, having to fly it yourself, then yes, if you uh, mess up during the charting, it potentially could uh, kill you or you could be spat out in some random system and you not know how to get home. Um, but generally, if it's already been charted and your nav computer has the jump like um, trajectory and coordinates already programmed in, then you'll automatically make it and you'll be fine. So really the risk in jump points are for the uncharted jump points that you don't have a nav uh, path already set. Um, so anyway, I hope that makes sense. Um, now, the next question is from- This is something that a lot of people don't know because this was talked about in the early days. We're so used to quantum jumping that we think that quantum jumping is the same as when you're doing a hyper jump, hyper drive, hyper drive jump. Some of you have seen on your ships, you have a space for a hyperdrive. That is because that's what you're going to need when you want to go through a wormhole. And what it does is it's a, it's a, it's a nav, it's supposed to be a navigational device. For not, the hyperdrive is the engineering side of it. But there is a nav computer that you're supposed to be able to also have on your ship that records when you travel and basically maps out going through these wormholes. Now, when you go through them the first time, as he says, you have to chart them. You, with, we saw this demonstration when they showed us the going to pyro, right? Where when you go in, you have to activate this computer and then you're going to have to literally fly the ship through the wormhole. And if you execute it and get it done and you make it to the other end, that information is recorded. Now, the next time when you want to go through the wormhole, that information is recorded. You can navigate it manually if you want to, or you can allow your computer to help navigate through it at that time. But everybody is going to have to do that. Now, They've talked about being able to sell that information too. Maybe someone does it, does the hard navigation, does the hard work and sells you that information. In the lore, uh, the Banu Merchantman, one of the things that makes that ship really great, other than, you know, people like it because it looks nice, um, is that their ships, if you, as you know, are passed down from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. And what they do is accumulate their travel information from when they've been doing trading to different systems. So their Nava computer is extremely valuable because they have for centuries been doing all this traveling to places and they have all that travel information locked down. So they don't have to worry about the dangers of going through a wormhole. Now, will this mean that once you get it recorded in there, you never have to navigate again? I don't know. See, they didn't say that. Maybe it assists you better when you go through it because I still think they want you to have some challenge of going through. Chris talked about also that when you're charting it for the first time, is there a risk of being killed or destroyed? Yes. He says, or you could be kicked out of the wormhole somewhere in, in space in between. I've always wondered what happens when that happens, right? Because let's say you're doing a jump that's over a very large a distance and you get kicked out somewhere in the middle. Well, it's not like there's another entrance to the wormhole there. Now you are light years or whatever away from someplace. How do you get to the next place now? You know, you're out in the middle of space, literally. You've got to, first of all, determine where you are in space. Hopefully your navigation system can recognize where you are. If you've got cartography, you can probably get away with it. But what happens if you don't have cartography? So we'll have to see. There's a lot there for them to be kind of figuring out for us to be able to determine when we're doing these jumps uh, through space. Okay. Um, they said that you can map the interior of it and sell the maps. Yes, 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 absolutely, prisoner. Um, can we... So we can fly, but if we're caught, we get fined. Yep, that might be what happens. I was planning to, the Genesis sneak people across the planets. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that is the case. Maybe when you go somewhere, if security stops you, if you don't have a permit, you know, that you get a fine. Maybe your ship gets confiscated. Ooh, that would be heartbreaking, right? All right, let's keep going here. From Krell, who asks, are asteroids and other space objects built in a modular fashion like the ships? It seems like you could design a few different building blocks for constructing asteroids and then randomly assemble them in lots of different ways. Um, so that is a good question. Um, <clears throat> we definitely have quite a few different asteroids, but we're actually doing R&D right now into um, 
a bunch of procedural generation of asteroids and asteroid fields. So, you know, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about procedural stuff and, and, and sort of crafted stuff, which Star Citizen is sort of more of a crafted experience. But <clears throat> we certainly are using uh, elements of procedural generation to help us flesh out a lot of the world. So my goal is to, um, to make sure that everything sort of feels designed and crafted, but you use uh, elements of procedural generation to sort of give you the variation that you need. So asteroids are a great example of that where, you know, we have certain rules for asteroids, uh, but, you know, we may, uh, you know, procedurally be generating the asteroid field or the asteroids themselves. And so we're actually doing some uh, pretty cool and interesting work on it. And down the road, we'll probably be sharing that with you guys. Okay, we've seen a lot with the asteroids over the years. We've seen them when they used to spin around. We've seen them static. We've seen them look kind of like a a baked potato. We've seen them look really detailed, uh, and and they've been morphing over the years. Um, so again, Chris says they're going to use they're using procedural generation to do it. We also know that for the world, they do use procedural generation. A lot of people think everything's handcrafted. It isn't. They use a combination of both procedure. That's just the normal thing, right? Uh, even Starfield has talked about that. They do use procedural generation, but when it comes to the areas, the landing zones, places that are important, POI stuff like that, the handcrafting comes in. It's one of the reasons why they spend so much time doing their tools so much time doing the tools so they can have that procedural world, but then later go on in and very quickly um, make a world that looks very handcrafted, very original, very unique, uh, and not like something that's just computer generated and spat out of a computer. Okay. Um, the last question, time for the chairman, this episode comes from Christopher Malik, who asks, whatever happened to the star map? I remember a while back in an in-game 3D star map in the works, uh, from the old videos, it looked pretty much done. Any word on when we will see that from the community? So, good question. Um, the star map, um, you know, that was sort of an early prototype that we'd mocked up inside the engine. Uh, it's not something that um, I'm ready to share yet. First of all, we've got a bunch more stuff to do uh, with it in terms of uh, fleshing out all our systems and making sure that we're happy with them, but also just in terms of the interface and how it works. So we're, we're actually doing a lot of work right now on sort of what we call our hollow renderer, which is the system that's going to be rendering sort of 3D holographic objects as well as uh, data and text on it. And that's, that's going to underform the pinning of pretty much all of our um, systems. So, you know, that would be the Moby glass that you have as you run around that you've seen in the fiction. Um, sort of your uh, first person HUD if you've got a combat suit on, um, your ship HUD, uh, which is when you're flying a ship. And, and we kind of want it all to sort of have this sort of, um, whether it's an Iron Man feel or a Minority Report feel or like you've seen in Prometheus, the hollow stuff. But the idea is there's a lot of sort of floating objects that you can manipulate and move around. And uh, obviously the hollow table, um, the equipment um, you know, device in the uh, hangar was the very, very, preliminary sort of work and, uh, you know, prototype of using some of this stuff, but we're doing stuff that's well beyond that, that's going to be much cooler uh, that we haven't shown you guys yet. And um, that will also be something that will drive the star map and your 3D maps and when you're inside your ships and stuff like that. So it'll be a while before we show it to you, but when you see it, I think you'll be pretty happy. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, okay. All right. So I hope you guys liked uh, my uh, answers. Thank you very much for writing in the questions. Thank you always for supporting uh, the game project. Uh, and um, anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's great to uh, be back here in 2014 and uh, raring to do some awesome stuff this year. So um, talk to you next week. To the star okay, map. that last question about the star map. A lot of you guys may remember that the star map, um, boy, this is a while back. There used to be like a holographic version of the star map in our ships, right in there in the center where right now we just have the map that kind of has the little dots on it and stuff. But back in the day, um, you used to be able to zoom in on that and actually click on it for where you wanted to go and jump and stuff. And then they took it out, they got rid of it. Uh, again, things come in, go in the game, nothing unusual. We know that CIG says they want this whole thing to be integrated between the map that's in your ship, the map that's in the Moby Glass, and also the star map that we have on the RSI website. They want all of that to be uniform. We know that the star map has always been a pain, right? I mean, it's it's wonky sometimes. They just recently took the um, the Aaron's Halo belt out. It used to be in there, it, would, it was never matching up to scale. Um, so we know it's changing all the time, but we do know that they want everything to kind of look way more like the website version of it. And I'm sure we're gonna see an enhancement of that because that came out in like, 
2014, 2015, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Big Star map. It was an award-winning uh, um, uh, website, in fact, when it came out. It was pretty pretty amazing. Um, it's gotten a little aged now, but it's still a very cool thing. The Star map is still very, very nice. They did have an earlier prototype um, that there's some, you can find the video every once in a while. If you look it up, look up Star Map and just Google it for Star Citizen, and you'll see there was there's actually a video of it. That was like a holographic thing. That's the thing that they're talking about. They said they saw it and it looked like it was pretty much done. That was all concept. It was just an idea that they were working on. It was never intended to be released to us. So that's what happened with that one. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on to the uh, next one. Uh, this That was episode number six that came out in January 24th of 2014. Now we're going to go three months later. This one's, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, why is this out of order? Oh, this was episode one. They put these things in here out of order. Shoot. All right. I tell you what, let me go ahead and do, I'm going to skip from this episode to six to episode seven. And next week I'm going to go back and do episodes one and two. Cause I didn't know this was out of order. My dopey stuff. I didn't see that. All right. So let's go to episode seven here. Okay. This is from. Uh, February 10th, 2014. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of 10 for the Chairman. For those of you that don't know, 10 for the Chairman is where I take 10 questions from our generous subscribers and uh, answer them uh, with detail and specificity uh, from the man himself um, as a way of uh, saying thank you for um, supporting uh, the game and also uh, enabling us to do the amount of community feedback we do, which involves this video, involves Wingman's Hangar, uh -huh. involves Jump Point Magazine, and a bunch of the other sort of community and posting and blog stuff that we do. Um, uh, you know, we essentially use the subscriber revenue to increase the information flow to the whole community, not just uh, subscribers. So thank you all for that. And I also want to say thank you uh, to SnugX for sending uh, me this uh, gift of The Blonde Knight of Germany, which is a uh, book about Eric Hartmann, who was a top uh, ace of World War II, um, which is pretty cool. I actually thought it may be interesting for you guys uh, to know that um, I'm actually obviously a big fan of uh, military aviation and just generally sort of uh, military um, history. Um, and um, I actually had uh, one of my film projects, actually the project I was going to direct after doing Wing Commander was, uh, it was a story that I, uh, uh, based on sort of real fact, but also had some fictional stuff, so think of it sort of like Titanic, on the original Blonde Knight of Germany, which was, um, Baron von Richthofen, The Red Knight. So uh, a massive amount, a huge collection of books on everything in World War uh, I aviation side, which was a pretty fascinating uh, time. And um, also where most of modern air combat maneuvering techniques, fights sort of originated from a lot of the stuff that um, you know, he and, and several of his compatriots uh, developed then. And particularly fascinating reading, but it's fun. And you'll obviously, I'm sure, having played Wing Commander, have seen a lot of um, uh, that World War II stuff all informed into it. So anyway, I thought that'd be fun, and I also thought it'd be kind of fun to show you that there's a picture here of um, uh, when I was actually, we were scouting for the movie, which we called The American Night, uh, which we were gonna do with Warner Brothers in 2003, but then casting things pushed it back, and then um, Flyboys didn't do very well, so it got put on the back burner, but one day I'll make this movie. Um, but this was we scouted in Romania our locations for battlefields in a 1956 Alouette, and uh, I have to tell you that it took some courage to get up in this thing because uh, I think the helicopter was, I mean, the helicopter was significantly older than I was. Uh, but you know what? It flew really well. Um, anyway, there you go. Um, all right, so on to uh, 10 for the chairman and the questions. So the first question comes from uh, Dagger25, and he asks, command and control and radar scanning detection have both been mentioned as parts of the game. Will a spacecraft like the F- 7C uh, Hornet Tracker be able to relay its gathered info into a command and control ship? And the answer is yes. The, the, the tracker is actually meant to be able to, um, essentially has a much bigger and more powerful uh, radar array and should be able to pump information to say another ship and can receive it. So someone in a tracker, the idea would be they're sort of like uh, command and control for a air group and uh, <coughs> there will definitely be big capital ships that will have even bigger command and control. And you could have a Hornet tracker relay its information to uh, a bigger ship as sort of like eyes and ears further out or possibly in an asteroid field where the visibility isn't very good. 
Um, and we're actually having a lot of fun on the capital ship um, build and design. I think you guys are going to be pretty blown away uh, when we sort of go into that in detail, uh, which we will do um, in the near future. It's something that the uh, Foundry 42 guys are spearheading uh, for us since there's so much capital ship stuff in um, Squadron 42. Uh, okay, on to the next question. Okay, looks like Chris just woke up. His hair is kind of all over the place, but um, <laughs> let's talk about that. A lot of people, um, this is one of those ships that you don't hear people talk about is the Hornet Tracker. Um, but there are ships that are reconnaissance um, ships like the Tracker, um, like the Terrapin. Uh, these ships that they've talked about that will be able to relay information. I just retain that information where they are, but also send that information back for tactical reasons, right? Um, and so... I'm, you don't hear anybody talking about that is like people say, oh, that's what I want to be doing. I want to be doing reconnaissance. You know, a lot of people have these other aspects of careers they want to do. But to me, these are the kind of roles that for people who may be in an org and maybe they want to find some way to contribute, you know, to do something. It's one of those support roles that doesn't necessarily mean that you're an ace fighter pilot uh, or that you're really good at FPS. But maybe you're a person who says, you know, I, I love the idea of this covert stuff, you know, going out there and flying out into space and gathering intelligence for the org when they're getting ready to start a battle. Uh, or maybe if it's exploration, whatever the case may be, a lot of different roles that players will be able to do in the game. And I think using ships like the Terrapin, like the Tracker, things like that, give people who may not be that great at being a fighter, fighter pilot, but it can get in and get out quickly. And that's their thing to do. And that's their contribution to an org. I think that is really, really awesome stuff. Question. Perry the Cynic asks, what happens when I fly to a banner world? Will it have spaceports I can land at, space stations to dock at, etc.? Will they be alien or do they have the same stores as human worlds? So the answer is yes, um, we definitely will uh, have spaceports. So, you know, the, we'll have you know, not the entire Banu um, area will be mapped out, although down the road it probably will be, but we'll definitely have Banu worlds you'll visit. Um, you can land at uh, and they'll probably have some space stations. Uh, and yes, they will be different in architecture. So we're sort of doing, we're designing that on the Jean right now. Uh, we're starting to do on the Banu. You can see the Banu Trader is a very sort of different look and feel than the human ships. Uh, and we'll be showing you some Jean stuff uh, pretty soon. It will be a very different look and feel than the human ships too. And we've got some um, Jean um, uh, architecture and plant stuff that we've sort of been working more on that is very different than human and we quite like it. So uh, we're trying to make each one of the different races have a very sort of distinct feel and personality, so you sort of feel, okay, I'm in human space, I'm in Banu space, I'm in Jean space. Um, so that's a long-winded uh, version of yes. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the Banu will have their own distinct, you know, spaceports, places where you can land and go, docks. Um, I am curious to see how much of these worlds, whether Jian, Banu, whatever, um, how they're designed around the idea of humanity and humans versus and I don't want to say this the wrong way, but it's like if you're going into their world, it should look like their world. You know what I mean? The band were very tall, lanky. Um, I would want us to think of the architecture, everything being based around that. I don't want to see a human door um, when I go to <laughs> uh, the band new worlds. I want to I want to be in their world as a human being. And hopefully it'll be the same thing for any of the other races. Um, I know that there's be some accommodations because obviously when they're being a trading group. They do want um, the humans to feel comfortable when they come into their world, uh, but I don't want it to be a, just like a you know a human built designed around humans, but it's alien looking. I really want it to be designed around that particular race, and then we actually have to accommodate to you know where we are. To me, that would be way 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 better. Okay, um, yeah. Let's see what goes on. Next one. Um, next question. Uh, Dragonfire asks: Are the class four turrets? Um, come as manned, or are they only remote controlled? Um, okay, so on the turrets, the uh, a class four turret is a bigger um, remotely controlled turret. It is not a manned turret. A class five turret and above a manned turrets. Um, so on a constellation uh, is two class five turrets. On the back of a freelancer, there's a class five turret. A class four turret um, is essentially a uh, a weapon mount that has. Um, uh, either a bigger gun or um, hard points for two smaller guns. So like a uh, good example is the Hornet, the ball turret is a class four, um, and also the canard turret is a class four. Um, a class two um, mount is essentially a very small turret that can only fit sort of one smaller gun on. So uh, an example of a class two mount is um, the 
wing gatlings on the Hornet, for instance, and a class one is a fixed mount for a gun. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, explains it to a certain extent. Uh, we have actually a bigger sort of setting that goes all the way up to class 10 for including capital ship um, mounts, uh, and those things include spinal weapons as well as much bigger uh, turrets that are sort of for ship to ship and stuff like that. Um, okay, next question. Okay, you guys know that that's all kind of changed over the time. They called them class back then versus size. Uh, you also know that we do have size five turrets, size four turrets that, that can be manned. I think the Starfarer's turret is a size five on top. <clears throat> so, you know, that has changed, right? But there are some turrets that are remote uh, that run into those categories. In the Redeemer, you've got remote cannons that can be size three or four. Uh, but there are some that are manned. So just be aware of that. He said that the Constellation had a size five on it. I'm like, ah, no, it doesn't. But you guys get it. Okay, things change. Uh, but you can see they were coming up with classifications back then. Um, Griesu, G-R-I-S-U, so I probably mispronounced that, um, asks, will I be able to make some credits with a cruise line? Or will the public transportation system make such services obsolete? Yeah, I mean, we're actually looking for ways that people can sort of run their own businesses in the game. So, uh, you know, obviously taking cargo around, um, you know, someone says, hey, take this um, piece of cargo or even take the ship from here to here for me because I want it over on this planet is something to do and I think that actually uh, we'd like to find a way that people could even transport people around uh, in a way that makes sense. Uh, there will be big cruise liners and stuff and there'll be a, there's a public transportation system that we've always, obviously already sort of um, promised and, and will be in there but it would be nice to sort of have a version where you know someone could have a ship and you know take some people from uh, one planet to another planet. I mean Partly, uh, you know, it would be kind of fun to have someone running a cruise liner and, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, maybe it's a, a bit over there, but it, you know, it'd be like murder on the Orient Express. Maybe people could get up to stuff on the cruise liner. It'd be kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, no, we're going to try and have roles for people to do all sorts of jobs in it. And one of them would be transporting people. Um, okay, next question. You know, a lot of people, you know, it's funny. I know someone mentioned in chat earlier, I think it was Prisoner or Kevion. Someone said that they had a, a Genesis. And, you know, it's always interesting to me that people, uh, Something like transporting for some people is totally like not their gameplay. They find no interest in it, nothing exciting about it. Uh, there are other people, uh, my friend Dark Knight, I mean, they're looking forward to being able to transport either people or NPCs. Um, they've really gotten excited about hearing this. There are even some orgs out there. Sergeant Gamble, oh my God. Thank good. I haven't seen you in forever. How are you? Good to see you. I hope you are doing well. I haven't seen that name in ages. Goodness gracious. Good to see you. Um, yeah, there are people who really are looking forward to this whole gameplay aspect of, um, of being able to transport people, you know, using the spaceports. Uh, this person asked a good question. Can there be one become obsolete? You know, if the NPCs are doing it, why should I get with a player? Once again, you're trying to balance this game out so that players will always be better than doing NPCs. NPCs are the fallback. If there is no player with a transport ship of some form, it doesn't have to be a Genesis, but a transport licensed out to travel from Microtech to Hurston. I'm just picking a random stuff here. Um, there will be an NPC ship that will NPC ship that will be leaving at some point that you can jump on if, if you can't get a friend to come pick you up. Um, but the idea is that Players are going to give you better service, better quality, you know, um, better gameplay. Uh, interactions will be better with a human versus NPCs. That's the, what they would like to do. Um, so I think that they're going to keep the balance going that way where you will always prefer riding with someone. Maybe if it's someone who you're chartering, you know, you can leave when you want to leave versus when you go to the spaceport, it says this, this ship isn't leaving for another 25 minutes, right? That will make the difference between whether you want to just be able to stick around and leave, go get something to eat or whatever the case may be. Okay. All right, here we go. Question, uh, Azim Maza asks, how can a player who only has two or three hours a week available to play even hope to get a level of enjoyment out of Star Citizen when the competition will be playing 10 to 20 hours a week? So that's a, I, I think that's one of those questions that um, sort of thinks of Star Citizen as being like one play path is one way to win. Uh, and the way I'm designing the game and the way I'm thinking about the game is it isn't like that. And it's, there are just different things you can do. So it sort of really depends on 
what you want to do and you know what is your definition of win because if you think about the real world you know lots of people have different definitions of like what makes them a winner is it they've made lots of money is it they've helped lots of people is it that they're an amazing athlete or is they are you know a great teacher um, you know there's all these different definitions and they can all be achieved at different levels some people achieve things they're happy with or greatness by themselves some people do it in a group um, and I think that's kind of the model of Star Citizen is that we're allowing um, things for you to do that you can, you know, like I'm, you know, if you just want to play by yourself and not deal with other people, there will be a game experience that will be very much like sort of the old privateer freelancer experience that will feel like that and you won't feel like you're pressured into being in the big group. But if you just want to play with, you know, a small group of your friends and go off and do stuff together, then you'll be able to do that too. Or if you want to play in a really big group or organization and try and sort of take over a part of space or build up a big sort of trading empire, you'll be able to do that. So I think the goal for us is to have lots of different things to do. And of course, you know, like say on some of these bigger things, there'll always be roles for people, you know, like a mining operation, right? Well, you know, there's someone that probably wants to own and build a mining operation, but then there may be people that are just like, hey, I just want to be a miner and earn a buck and I'm there and I work for this corporation and do the mining. And so I think that's a better way to think about it. So it's not so much about two to three hours or 10 to 20 and you're competing against everyone else because it's sort of what you want to do in the game. And I think you should be able to have fun um, with two to three hours, um, even if someone else is playing uh, 10 to 20 hours, it's just you'll be doing kind of different things. You maybe won't be able to do as much stuff, but hey, that's, that's the nature of peace. But I definitely don't think you'll be not having fun only playing for two or three hours. You just, you know, be doing potentially different stuff or less of it. Um, okay, hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think, you know, this is a good one. KVN, yeah, you hit it on the head and I was going to comment on it. I didn't even know he was going to say it too. You know, one of the things that they're doing with this game, which is unique, it may not seem unique, but when you think about it, to me, it is. They're trying to create a game that allows almost, and I'm saying almost, any type of gameplay to find its place in its world. Now, that's a difficult thing to do because technically, CIG has said that this game is not, they don't consider it an MMO like we would think of MMOs normally. They see it as a hybrid. They see it as a, a living simulated universe more than an MMO exclusively, even though it has MMO possibilities to it. I mean, obviously they're designing the game so that there's collaborative play. Chris enjoys that. He, you know, this, the, he, he creates these dependencies where we're able to help each other. But there is that side of the game that they're creating with NPCs that says that NPCs are the predominant force. They're, they're nine to one ratio of us in the universe and that if I want to interact and do things that way, I can. Last night, I went in and ran some bunker missions and I did them by myself. I went out, did my inventory. I did the bunker missions. I had a great time all by myself playing against NPCs. As I was ready to log out, a, a, new, a player who hadn't been around for a good while came in and said, hey, I haven't been playing the game for a while. How do I get bunker missions? How do I do them? And then I chose to say, listen, I'll do a couple with you to help you out and get you started. So then I went and did that same thing with another player. And now I was playing with someone and I enjoyed that gameplay just as much as I did when I was playing by myself. Creating a balance of the game that doesn't feel like anytime I do something, I have to do it with somebody or I have to do it by myself is a very difficult balance to create. And I'm hoping CIG is able to do that across the board, not with just something as simple as a mercenary mission, but when it comes down to cargo. When I played Eve, I would do cargo runs by myself. Dangerous thing to do, but it made the gameplay pretty intense for me. I'd be out there by myself jumping systems to get somewhere. People say, oh, you shouldn't do that. I did do it and it did work. Did I have some losses on occasion? Yeah, but most of the time I was successful. But then there were other times where I would do runs and I'd have a group of people and we go mining as a group. And that was fun too. Being able to create that balance in all the different career areas of this game is going to be an interesting aspect. If I've got a crucible, should I be dependent upon players coming to me? No, maybe there's a mission I can take where I have to repair an NPC ship that's been destroyed. That That's me and myself and I out there doing it. Um, can I run a javelin by myself? Probably not. I hear people say this all the time. I'm going to get my Idris and I'm going to fill it up with blades and go out. I think that goes against what the game is supposed to be, actually. Uh, I think you, not that you can't go fly it out, but we all know that there are different workstations and different things. The Orion's the same way. There are distinct stations. Can I work everything from that? No, if, I've got, if I do, I'm going to sacrifice something. 
the mold. People do that with the mold. I've seen people solo mold. They have a great time doing it, but they're also willing to take on a higher level of risk. And a lot of the risk still isn't even built into the game yet. You know, leaving that cockpit seat to go down to a laser is a dangerous thing. It's uh, something uh, that goes beyond the danger for me. I don't even like doing that. You know, I'll go get in the prospector and just say, I'll just do it that way. But some people enjoy doing that. They're willing to take on the risk. The risk is going to get higher, though. It's going to get greater. Uh, the vulnerability factors are going to be there even more once NPCs and other things are in the game. And maybe that person who wants to solo in the mole may not do it anymore, or maybe they will. You know, maybe they'll roll the dice, you know, and see how it goes. So this thing about the hours in the game, um, there are times when I come into Star Citizen and I'll play for 30 minutes and I'm gratified. There are other times when I come into the game and I play for five hours and I'm gratified. I think that they're going to create that balance that's there. Sometimes there's only so much you can do. People want to do everything within a two or three hour period. And I understand that. Some people have limited time. They work. They got a family. The only time they've got is maybe from eight till 10 o'clock at night to play the game. Uh, and maybe the most they'll be able to do is get themselves set up and go out and start a mission. And then I'll have to bed log. And then maybe the next time they come back, they come back, they bed log. They're able to now accomplish what it is they want to do. But that's going to be the nature of the game. I don't think there's going to be a thing of being able to expedite things to make things happen just because our schedules are tight. I think that they're creating a world simulator. There is an aspect where time has to pass in a reasonable fashion, but also not so fast that it's become, it breaks immersion. I'll put it that way, that it breaks immersion. But that's just my two cents, okay? Here we go to the next question. Okay, so next question comes from Dream Rider, uh, who asked me, uh, you still have the complete order of battle for the Battle of Austerlitz in glorious 15 millimeter hand-painted miniatures. How many men per figure? How many figures per regiment? And did you paint them all yourself? Uh, not really a Star Citizen question, but um, obviously I can't put the entire order of battle, but yes, these are um, some of the miniatures. The rule set that I was having them built to was um, Empire 3, um, and it's been so long since I've actually played these because uh, I essentially started uh, putting this together after my ill-gotten gains on the very first Wing Commander, which is 24 years ago. And of course, whenever you're making games, you don't actually get to do uh, that much game, as much game playing as you wanted to. But yeah, no, I had a whole, um, in my old Austin house, I had a whole room built up for Bell with a whole bunch of Geohex and all the rest of the stuff. And uh, of course, I was also making games, so I didn't have as much time to paint everything. So most of this was actually um, painted in the UK and then shipped over to the US, although some of it was uh, painted by me. Here is a small Hussar regiment, or a light cavalry French regiment, but uh, we can show you a picture, but that was all done by me, which I think uh, I'm quite um, quite enjoyed a long time ago, but it's also pretty painstaking. But yeah, so it sort of sits there, and one day I will uh, have, uh, uh, hopefully, play the battle again, but I haven't managed to do it for at least 20 years, although I keep all my miniatures around, which is a small little selection here that you can see. On to my next question is uh, from Freelancer117. Uh, which asks, will Squadron 42 uh, and Star Citizen... Hi, Sergeant. I'm sorry, I got the timer on there. I have to change that. I forgot about it. Good to see you, buddy. anti-aliasing uh, in the CryEngine. Um, so I believe that we pretty much support all the uh, anti-aliasing uh, setups, so SMAA... Sorry. Chris talked about his models from when he was doing war games and stuff. That was cool stuff. The, I, I don't think he ever said if he hand-painted them or not, but he said they'd been around for 20, 20 years, a long time. Uh, I think FXMAA, uh, and there's quite a few other ones, um, and I'm sure we'll be sort of supporting any new stuff that comes out as far as that goes. I mean, we've got a pretty big graphics team right now. We have four dedicated graphics engineers, and we're looking to hire another two to three. Um, my goal is actually to have more graphics engineers on Star Citizen than even Crytek has it um, uh, in, in all of Crytek. Uh, I may not achieve that, but um, we're going to give it a good try. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess the answer is yes on that one. Um, okay, next. Okay, and his question here was about anti-aliasing and the graphics, uh, what they'll be able to do in the game. Um, will Squadron 42 have SMAA enhanced sub metaphorical anti-aliasing anti in the CryEngine? And we guys know this is all moved beyond CryEngine. Um, you know, we've gone from CryEngine to Lumberyard, Star Engine. Um, it, it, it's, it's been molded into a whole different thing. And we know that they are trying to support everything where we've been waiting on Vulcan 2 next to come up as our next stage that they're working on. So, you know, been there, done that on that one, okay? I own an Idris, and the next uh, question comes from Vi Viper Alpha, who asks, I own an Idris and several Super Hornets. 
I want to base the Hornets full time in my Idris. All ships are on the same account. Will there be a way to park and leave fighters in the fighter bay of the Idris? Uh, so the answer is yes. I mean, the Idris is designed um, to have a complement of uh, some ships on it. I think uh, sort of in Squadron 42, we sort of decided that it has an active complement of two ships. So in the military, it's two Hornets, and then it has a uh, sort of backup spare Hornet in case one gets destroyed or all the rest of the stuff. And that's sort of the standard complement on a sort of, uh, you know, a military patrol setup. Uh, so if you have, uh, say, two Hornets, um, you definitely will be able to have them in your Idris. Um, it's almost, think of it like um, big ships have their inventories and smaller ships have inventories, rooms have inventories, and so you essentially move um, your uh, Hornet from the inventory in your hangar to the inventory in your Idris, which is basically the, the, the hangar there. So yes, you will be able to do that, so um, you know, you'll be well armed. Um, and um, you should be able to hire either NPCs to fly it or um, more preferably, because um, something like an Idris is um, really not designed to be a solo uh, vehicle, you and your friends um, can have fun. And we're doing some, as I mentioned a little earlier in the, uh, in the show, uh, talking about sort of the uh, Hornet tracker and command and control ships, we're really doing some stuff on the bigger ships, the capital ships that I'm super excited by. Uh, that's really going to push it. I mean, it's going to be like almost a whole game in itself running these big ships. And uh, so I think you guys are really going to like that. Next question comes. Okay. Now things could change, but based on what he said there, he said the Idris is not designed to be a solo ship. Uh, I didn't know he was going to say that, but he, he does mention that. He says it's designed for multiplayer gameplay. And again, um, it, it, that could change. You know, they, maybe they could come up with something that allows people, maybe, you know, some... And I, and I, I want to say that when you say it's not designed for, it's not that you can't do it. It's not designed for, and there's a big difference. It, to maximize what you can do with it and to play the ship the way it's designed to be done, you know, the idea is that you would have multiple people on it. Are you going to get everything out of it if you don't have everybody on it? Probably not. You know, risk factors, a whole bunch of other things involved in that. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I, I don't want to belabor that point. I do want to go back to something that someone said earlier. Yeah, KV on you were saying about um, them creating, uh, well, one of the comments was about whether or not people can do anything in 30 minutes. Yes, you can. It depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many of you all, when you play Star Citizen, have gotten to the point where you stay on your ship, for example. Like, literally, you live on your ship. You log in, you log out. I know it was buggy for a while. Logging wasn't working. But when it is working, do you always go back to a base and log out at the end of the day? You know, is that something that you do? It's not what the game is supposed to be. Later on, the idea is supposed to be when you're in space, that's where you log out at. You don't have to go back to a station. Um, the, idea, the, the idea of the game, at least. Um, when worlds are there, when we do have our own uh, places where we live, you know, where we set up habs or whatever, those will be the places where you live, understandably. You may not always go back to it. You may only go back to it when you finish doing whatever it is you're doing in space. Um, I do think that... Um, there will be gameplay that says that, you know, you could stay at a certain place for a long period of time, not leave. I don't think there'll be a lot of system hopping per se. Uh, when you're in a system, you'll be working that system. You'll be doing something in that system. Maybe just for that particular game session, maybe you'll be out there for a week or two. You know, if you're doing exploration, who knows how long you'll be in a certain area. If you're doing trade, if the trade is good in an area, why would you leave if you don't need to, right? So there's going to be a lot of things, possibilities of what we can do in the game. Uh, I think they're trying to keep it open-ended as much as possible uh, so that we don't feel like we're being handheld to do certain things, but we can choose whether we want to stay in an area, leave an area, work in an area, play in an area, whatever the case may be. Okay. comes from Slackar. Um, Slacker. See, I see what you did there. Uh, who asks, when are the Christmas decorations coming down? Uh, yeah, I know. We've uh, I've been pretty tardy <laughs> on getting these Christmas decorations down because it's February right now. I believe we're planning to do a um, hangar update in the next week or so on one of the, it's a house cleaning update and one of the things in the update will be bringing the Christmas uh, decorations down. Uh, so very soon will be the answer there. All right. All right, this was February and somebody's asking about the decorations. Some of you guys may remember in the early days, we had the hangar module. This is before we had space and all that other stuff. And you would come in during the holidays and your hangar would be decorated with a big wreath and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's what they're referring to about when will the decorations come down. Um, and that was based upon the next patch, right? Because patches weren't like we get them now quarterly. They happened whenever they happened. And that stuff was still up a couple months later. 
right now, even Invictus uh, material is still up, you know, because, you know, that was our last patch. Uh, so hopefully when 320 comes out, all the Invictus stuff will go away because it's still sitting up, which amazes me because it's August. Okay. All right. Very final last question here um, is uh, from exotic.tofu, who asks, I see when the plan will be to have things added and updated over time. Does this include graphic updates as well? Um, yes. I mean, the, yes, obviously. So, you know, the long term plan is Star Citizen is never going to really stop being developed. It's never going to stop having content added to it. It's never going to stop having functionality added to it. So the way I look at it is, I mean, even just- Let me stop him there. You guys heard that. It will never stop being in development, never stop being worked on, never stop getting content. Uh, people say, when is it going to come out? When is it going to be done? He just told you it's not going to be done. It'll be a continue, just like Eve, it'll continue. That's the idea. Now, of course, every game can come to a stop. But the idea is that they constantly are building it out. That's why we have 100 systems. Not to reference anything, but Starfield. People are like, well, Starfield's only got 10% of its worlds. Yeah, because they're going to build it out over time. That's not just a solid one game. They want to be able to expand it, and it becomes a franchise that lasts for years. Star Citizen is no different than that. Now, you know, everyone having the hangar last year, you know, we're going to have the dogfight, uh, you know, in the near future here. Um, and that's sort of even like the early versions of adding the functionality and content. But so, you know, kind of like our, our sort of projected path is, okay, we'll do the dogfight, uh, the base dogfight, which is you'll be able to fly around in sort of single-seater fighter style stuff. And then uh, we'll have another update that will bring in the multi-crewed ships, the bigger ships. Uh, and then we'll probably have some kind of update that will involve some first-person combat stuff. And then we'll have some update that will involve bringing all that together. And then some update involving the planet side. And so we're just sort of building the game over the time. And we won't change that philosophy even after the game is finished. Like, you know, you can go around the full persistent universe with the initial um, set of planets because we'll be adding uh, new content and new functionality, and we'll also uh, be continually sort of R and Ding new stuff. So you know, ultimately, long term, I'd love to be able to have a way to go seem you know like essentially seamlessly down onto the planets. Maybe have some more procedural generation. Have a way to sort of build out stuff, and that's all stuff that we're actually uh, doing R and D on now, um, not for the initial release, but just to get it sort of a process, evaluate what the issues are, and we're allowed to do that because you guys have been so generous in, in backing us that um, you know, we have funds to sort of do some long-term research and development stuff. And the goal is that, yeah, we aren't gonna uh, you know, stand through just the same way, like if you look at the Hornet now, and you look at the Hornet when I did my original um, presentation in the tech demo, it's, you know, the Hornet's got much more detail because we're always constantly refining and updating stuff, and that, won't, that will not stop once we're live. The goal is to make this the most sort of lived in, immersive, detailed universe possible. And uh, obviously we're not gonna get it all for you know the first time the Pizzling Universe is active for everyone. And so that'll just take time afterwards and some of the features that even you know we've gotten on some of the stretch goals or some of the content you know won't drop right at the very beginning because it's just taking a lot of time to do all this stuff, but it will always go in. So hopefully you'll you'll feel uh, you know, things are always moving forward and there's new stuff coming in. And especially as we sort of are scaling the team, which we're still doing, we'll able that will all sort of snowball. So this year you're definitely going to see a lot more hey, Jolly. than last year. And I think then, you know, after that it'll be even more so. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope you found the 10 for the uh, chairman interesting this week and enjoyed looking at my little miniatures and hearing about Rick Tofen. And uh, again, thank you for SnugX for the book on uh, the Blonde Knife Germany. Um, and thank you to all subscribers out there for um, helping uh, us improve and be able to afford a higher level of sort of community uh, feedback and content. Um, and I will see you next week. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's this week's episode. Um, it's interesting about the graphics, you know, asking about will they be able to keep things up? And I know people, I've heard a variety of things, right? Um, some people say Star Citizen is the best screenshot. <laughs> simulator out there right other people think that it looks dated i'm always it's always interesting to see what people think about the game my, atti <clears throat> my attitude about the graphics for star citizen has to do with um style the style of the graphics um i think the game looks great i think it looks incredible in fact um and and, and i know that there are people who will take different things to compare it against like particularly the unreal engine but 
I'm going this is how this is how I look at it. You can look at it however you want, obviously, but this is how I look at it. There games have their own stylized look. For example, No Man's Sky. When No Man's Sky was announced, I didn't like No Man's Sky. Not because of gameplay or anything else. I didn't like the look of it. I didn't. Um, but then I played it and I enjoyed it. And when I played it and enjoyed it, I appreciated the stylized look of its art. It has a different type of look. Their ships look a certain way. They don't look realistic. They have a fantasy animated kind of look to it. But in that world, it works. And I like it a lot. If they were to try to create that world using Unreal graphics, it would we wouldn't have that game right now. Guaranteed, it wouldn't be out. <clears throat> Unreal has not produced a major MMO game w yet that that shows everything. It, it, we know the the possibilities of what it can do, and if it did, the most machines couldn't run it. World of Warcraft, when it came out, um, had a stylized look. I didn't like World of Warcraft. I'm a big D and D person. I love D and D but I never played World of Warcraft because I didn't like the look. Now, does that take away from the game? The, it's it's the most popular MMO ever, right? People love that game. I still haven't played it, mostly because I still don't like the look. But uh, it was also because at the time, I a few months earlier, I'd started playing Star Wars Galaxies. And because I was deep into that, I didn't get on the World of Warcraft wagon. And a few years later, when Star Wars Galaxies ended, um. Elder Scrolls was out. I started playing that, which I loved a lot. And then Elder Scrolls Online came out, which I beta tested and loved that. So I never entered the D&D &D world through World of Warcraft. I did it through ESO. Doesn't take anything away from World of Warcraft. I'm sure it's a great game. People love it. I talk to people all the time who love that game. And it's awesome. Star Citizen to me has its own look. It has a, a somewhat realistic. It's not a super realistic work. Like look like um, Unreal. Uh, but I, the way it looks to me, I can step into the world and I enjoy that look. And if you've been around any length of time, we were talking about this the other day, go back and look at 2017's moral tour. The very first example we got from squadron 42, and then look at the vertical slice they did just a year later, the graphics dramatically changed in one year. Uh, when 318 came out, 317 came out, they did graphics passes on the game where you could see improvements. So there's this constant I think CIG is very much aware of the need to keep the game relatable and relevant to what's going on in the industry, but at the same time, it, they don't have to force themselves to make a super ultra ultra realistic game. Uh, it's to me the realism is there. It looks great, still beautiful to fly over uh, Orison uh, at sun at sunset or sunrise. Uh, still love watching Crusader uh, from Daymar. To me, it works, and I know it's different for everybody, but for me. The game is, is beautiful. Okay. We've got enough time to squeeze in one more episode. I said we were going to do three episodes a week. Let's go ahead and hit episode number eight. This comes from February, just a few days, seven days later, seven days after the last one, February 17th of 2014. Let's take a look. Hello everyone, welcome to 10 for the Chairman. Uh, for those of you that haven't watched this before, this is where I take 10 questions that have been asked by our subscribers uh, and uh, answer them in as much detail as I possibly can. Uh, our subscribers are um, the uh, subsoup of the backers of Star Citizen that uh, contribute additional money every month uh, that essentially allows us to do a lot more of the sort of community uh, feedback, content, so this show, uh, Wing Wins Hangar, um, and uh, the Jump Point magazine and a bunch of other stuff uh, that we're doing is really sort of supported by uh, the subscribers. So thank all of you very much. Um, and speaking of, um, I'm actually sort of looking at um, one of the things that we promised for the Imperator uh, subscribers was having your name up in the office. And so we're sort of looking at the installation. So we're sort of considering a uh, two-layered uh, where all the names are on the front and then on the back uh, we sort of will back like this and have it front mounted and uh, it'll be a big installation in front of a Star Citizen logo with all the names on the front with maybe some side lighting and stuff but we're still working on it but thought you'd be interested to see that in progress so uh, let's get to the question shall we so I'll just put this off to my side um, so the first question um, comes from me not me but Emmy who asks what is your opinion on being able to make real world money from playing online games would you consider such a system in Star Citizen <laughs> um, so uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I actually was thinking about this a lot at the beginning. I actually thought it'd be really cool that you could be playing this game. And 
uh, making uh, some some real world money from actually you know toiling away virtually. Uh, but right now we don't have any plans uh, for that. Um, you know there are some sort of legal issues to be dealt with, and then also um, the you know I had some concerns about whether. Um, that would potentially sort of bring something into the game that uh, may make it less for fun and and uh, uh, be problematic. So right now we don't have any plans. Um, may assess it in the future, but I kind of would really like to see how the Persistent Universe plays, how everything works, how people interact with each other before making a decision like that, because I think that potentially could be um, fairly unbalancing. I know that there was uh, you know issues on uh, Diablo with their uh, sort of real money auction house. Um, but uh, so interested um, intellectually, but not necessarily uh, convinced I want to put it in the game just yet. Uh, so that will be a put a pin in it one. Um, okay, on to the next question. So that's interesting. The idea of making money while playing Star Citizen, what we call play to earn, right? Versus play to win, play to earn. Um, I'm one of those people that's really not that crazy about when you introduce real money. First of all, you guys know how people act with fake money, right? <laughs> with phony money. Um, you can go on eBay right now and buy not UEC, AUEC, all right? People are already doing things with real money, all right, um, in the game. And, you know, when you start introducing real money into a game, my concern is the balance, obviously. Um, the, the idea of making sure gameplay remains important and then at the same time, if there's money involved, that money in some way or other does not overshadow gameplay. That's to me, it shouldn't overshadow it. If it complements it, that's fine. But for something like Star Citizen, I'm not sure that that would work. I know that we do have <clears throat> Star Atlas, which is in development now. Uh, great looking game, gonna be built in Unreal 5. Uh, they're using Web3 browser technology and the NFT aspects of it, but we have yet to see how that will play out yet. Um, and I, I worry about things like anything that's got to do with crypto, not because I have a problem with crypto, crypto is fine with me, but I do deal with is the volatility of the market. And how do you control that? Because that volatility in the real world will translate into the game world in some form, unless you've got some real strong backing and buffers to, to offset it. Um, that could be a real problem. So when you start, and that's not even dealing with crypto, but this is deal with money in general. We do know that in Star Citizen, they do have areas for gambling. There are, uh, there, there's, there's <laughs> you could gamble in all types of ways in this game if it's based on what they have in it. There's the pool rooms that are there, right? The, the people could be gambling and betting with each other with who's going to beat each other in pool. We've got the racetracks where, where gambling could come in and become involved. I'm talking in the real world, people could be doing it. Um, what else do you have? You've got in the bars, you've got the arcade machines. I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm curious to see where, how CIG is going to implement that stuff into the game so that it doesn't become a problem because in some countries it will become an issue legally uh, if money, if real world money becomes involved. So I don't think they're going to touch on that. I don't know if there's a need to do it. Um, it may be more of a headache than anything else, but hey, if you guys feel like it should happen, I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's go to the next question. Radar asks... Uh, the Hornet is a purebred dogfighter and a nice design, but it also has a feeling of being the F-18 of the UEE. Will we see different designs of purebred dogfighters in SC, or will it remain more along the lines of uh, Hornet versus Vandal fighter? No, I think we're definitely going to see some other dogfight designs. We're definitely going to have another UEE uh, fighter craft. Uh, we're still sort of in the process of planning that out. We've, we obviously have a couple of um, sort of military uh, spec bombers that we've talked about. One is the Gladiator, the other is the Retaliator, and right now we only have uh, you know, one uh, dogfighter, and obviously it's kind of a multi-role um, fighter, which is really what an F-18 is. And I think you would probably have more sort of a space superiority fighter, um, and maybe even a sort of lighter um, design than the Hornet. Um, so, uh, so yes, there will be more, um, and uh, stay tuned. That will be something that will uh, be uh, fleshing out for Squadron 42. Okay. Hey, God forbid the person didn't know what they were asking for when they asked for more ships, right? Because we definitely got plenty of ships. Um, Gladestone, it's still under Lumberyard, but C C CIG has kind of created their own version, you know, that came out of CryEngine that is like their own custom version of it under Amazon. Um, and it was called Star Engine, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I think it's Star Engine. Um, 
But anyway, yeah, that's that's what they they basically did. It went from CryEngine, Lumberyard ended up buying the licensing for it, and they partnered with Amazon. Then they tweaked it and did a little bit more, and they've got their own custom version of the engine. Okay, next one up. Hope I got that right. <laughs> MK asks, if I've purchased more than one package, each including a hangar, business, and deluxe, and also purchased an asteroid hangar, will that translate into at least two hangars when the Persistent University comes out? Hmm, that's, a, that's kind of a good question. We were sort of thinking that you would have uh, one home base hangar, and then if you wanted to sort of had uh, like places that you would go um, and sort of have sort of forward bases or whatever, that would be you would be sort of renting um, hangar space on a planet or whatever. Um, so I don't know because currently the design would say no to that, although there could be an argument to say, well, you know, I've got multiple packages, each one should have a hangar, and therefore I should be able to place them in different places. Um, but really the concept of the hangar was uh, we were just giving you a free place to have all your stuff. It wasn't that you would like be buying multiple houses around the universe. Uh, so I would say uh, I don't know whether you know the two hangers. I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to ask on the asteroid hangar because that's a very distinct thing and it's uh, sort of a more in a different um, location than say a business or a deluxe hangar. Uh, so I guess my question would be, or my, not my question, but my answer would be, um, haven't made the decision on that yet, but that is a good point. Um, so I will, I will take that off and be thinking about like how to make that equitable without having um, you know, someone buying 20 packages and just basically like snaffling up a bunch of real estate that they can put all around, uh, around the universe because that's what it would defeat part of the pur purpose of like getting people to play because actually being able to get a hangar and all the rest of the stuff should you know, take some work to achieve um, and I don't want everyone to suddenly like be 100% fully set up. Um, but um, it's a good question, so I will, um, I, will, I will think about that. So I don't have a good answer for you right now, but uh, you brought it up, so that, that's, uh, that's already a victory. Okay, next question comes. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, KV on to answer your question, I think Jolly answered it. Back in the day, when you would buy your ship and you'd buy your package, depending on which package you got, there was a certain hangar attached to it, as you know. So like if you bought a small ship, like, a, like a, a, an Aurora or Mustang, you would get the Selfland hangar, right? Um, each one of these hangers went up to the Revel in York, and then there was an asteroid hangar. This was an asteroid, a hangar that was in an asteroid. Now, mind you, this is in the days where you just went in your hangar, you couldn't fly out of it. So you would spawn your ship in there to take a look at it. And, and if you had hangar flare, you could decorate it. And it had stairs and scaffolds and all that stuff. There's lots of videos on YouTube. Just type in Star Wars asteroid hangar and you'll see it. Uh, it was a really big hangar. It had like three really big pads on it. And usually if you had a larger ship, like a, it had to be something industrial, like a, I think the Retaliator got that hangar. Uh, what else got the industrial hangar back in the day? I don't know if the Starfarer got it. I can't remember now, but there were certain ones that you would get. Um, and uh, you could just spawn your stuff inside of it. But Chris, is, it's interesting that he says here that if you've got 10 different packages and 10 different hangers, you're not going to get 10 different hangers to spread out the universe. Uh, more than likely, you're going to get one particular place to base. Maybe you'll get to choose what type you want. You know, some of the examples of that, like if you go to Microtech, that's the, um, I can't think what that hanger is called. He, he, he says it here at the beginning. Let's see, I'm at 538. Let me see where if I can find it. Uh, where? The business. It used to be called the business hangar. That was the original title for it back in the day. Architect, good to see you. How are you? Thanks for stopping in. Uh, and the, the deluxe hangar was the Revel in York hangar. That's what they used to call them back in the day. Back in the day, it was only like those two. And they had the Selfland hangar, which was the, the one that was kind of like the rustic looking, you know, the real basic looking hangar. And then later on, they had the asteroid hangar. But anyway, there were four of them back in the day. Okay, back in the day, there were four of them. All right. That, so I don't have a good answer for you right now, but uh, you brought it up, so that, that's, uh, that's already a victory. Okay, next question comes from Brendan Waterlong. Arrow view, thank you. Will the dogfighting module be released in sections depending on the ships that can be used? And if so, will I have to wait till, until my ship, the Aurora LN, is playable? Um, okay, so the, the dogfighting module itself um, is going to be staged in various releases. 
The first dogfighting release is going to focus on the single-seater ships, so the multi-crewed ships uh, won't be in the very first release of um, the dogfighting. Um, that will be a later release, mainly because there's a whole extra level of sort of network uh, complexity with multiple people running around a ship, and we've got to simulate the physics separately, and that's all stuff that's in development that we're working on right now, but um, won't be ready for prime time by the time release. So our focus for Dogfighting 1 is the single-seater ships, which would be um, uh, you know, primarily our test case is the Hornet, but also the Aurora, the 300i, um, the um, uh, uh, Cutlass, um, and the Aurora, uh, sorry, no, and the Avenger, uh, would all be sort of the ships that we would be sort of focusing to try and have, right, out ready for Dogfight V1. Um, not all of them are going to make it just because there's a huge amount of assets that have to be built in terms of, yes, you have them in the hangars right now, but you don't have all the damage states and all the damage and all those bits. Uh, and we are working on those, so we actually have like quite a lot of people working on all the parts, but our approach is on the dogfighting module that when uh, V1 is, is uh, ready to go, we're not going to hold it up because we don't have every single one of those ships, but as soon as they're ready, they'll, they'll get patched in. So likely, likelihood is the Aurora is probably going to be there for dogfighting V1, as will the Hornet, and hopefully the 300i, because those are the three most common uh, single-seater dogfighting ones, and then the other ones will be more about um, will they make it in time, or if not, you know, they'll come in a few weeks later or whatever. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. I think if you've got an Aurora, you're probably uh, in, uh, in luck, so to speak. So Sior Okay, so just so you know, back in the early days of the Arena Commander, don't forget it was a module. You only had like maybe three or four ships that it was it. That was it. If you had other ships that you paid for, they weren't in Arena Commander. Now we know most of the ships, a lot of them are in there. And it's not until just this next upcoming patch in 320 that they're going to make it where you're multi-crewing in there. This was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, they were talking about this, but it's just now at 3.20 3 that you'll finally be able to do multi-crewing inside Arena Command. Alpine Wolf asks, with the organizations being a huge hit with the community, I was wondering if organizations will have the ability to be more than just a shell that encompasses a group of players under the same banner. Will they have the ability to perhaps build a base from which they can produce items such as ammunition, which could mean that a refinery will be needed to extract relevant materials from resources uh, or, or collect uh, from salvage or mining? So yes, that is actually the goal of organizations is to, they're not just meant to be a sort of friends list. Um, organizations ultimately will be able to, um, you know, tax or tithe their members, um, sort of have common assets. Um, so like everyone can put money in, the organization could buy some ships or the organization could buy some real estate. Um, ultimately, um, that would be sort of an organization potentially could be controlling an economic node. An economic node is what we talk about being, you know, a, a factory producing weapons or a, a mining operation, mining materials and stuff. And so, uh, you know, one of the um, goals of the organization system is to allow sort of groups of uh, people to um, work together and to maybe achieve objectives that a single person won't necessarily be able to do by themselves, which would be you know, control a big mining operation or something like that. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, next okay, there you go. Um, orgs are gonna be bigger than just places for people to get together, that literally orgs can actually have impact in the verse. You're running a big mining operation on some moon or something like that with their bases, whatever the case may be, but they do want it to be more than just you jumping into Discord and just hanging out. They want it to be much bigger than that. Next question comes from Commissar, and he asks, when player organizations enter into direct conflict, how will NPC organizations such as the UEE respond? Will there be a need for a declaration of war such that the UEE recognizes the conflict and does not interfere? That is a good question again. I mean, I don't really think that the organizations necessarily have to declare war against each other because they're essentially sort of private corporations or groups of people or guilds, and uh, you know, there's always conflicts between them. Now, of course, depending on what happens uh, or where the battles happen, um, you know, the UEE may step in. So, you know, two organizations cannot go toe to toe out in the orbital space of Earth uh, because the UEE is going to say, you know, we, we uh, you know, conflict is not allowed in in this safe area. Whereas you could probably be fighting. Uh, you know, in the outer edge of the galaxy, and then that'll be fine because there isn't any sort of UE role. So I, so I kind of see that like organizations fighting against each other will mostly be fighting on over areas of resources that are sort of on the fringe of sort of the UE controlled space, and then there will be some sort of clan, uh, clandestine activity happening inside UE space. 
but there won't be all-out war like right in the middle of UAE space um, uh, because you know that would be problematic. Just like if you had uh, I don't know. IBM and Apple had a bunch of mercenaries and started shooting each other in the streets for dominance in the tech industry. Um, probably, you know, uh, the United States of America would frown, um, frown upon such actions. So it'll be along those lines. I mean, maybe we'll find a way to allow the organizations to bring conflict on a more limited stage into sort of more sort of UE controlled areas. But in, for me, I sort of feel like I'd like to see um, sort of competition via like industry and, and, and business and then um, you know sort of more some like kind of you know back to stealthy kind of stuff that people are going after each other and then all out warfare is sort of on the edges of the galaxy um, okay. yeah, so that'll be interesting to see what happens with orgs right org battles or conflicts uh, or treaties all that good stuff Chris does make it very clear though there are certain areas where those battles will not be able to take place just because they're UEE dominant space I you know <clears throat> I'm curious to see how they're going to monitor that because I get like, there's some things that you can tell like already right now, like, right. Like when you're using a Mantis, if you set it off within a UEE parameter, if you're within a comms area, it gets detected. Uh, and I'm curious to see whether or not they're going to do something like that to, if you're outside of a comms area, you can have a battle there. But if you're too close to some place where comms are, you run the risk of being detected by, uh, the UEE. We'll have to see how they come up with that, but it's interesting that there will be certain areas where they don't want that type of conflict taking place. Okay, next question comes from uh, Kazansky, who asks, is CIG taking steps in Star Citizen to make the game more Oculus Rift compatible than just making the headset work again? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're going to make the Oculus Rift work uh, like for the Oculus Rift in the game. We're not just sort of like having the Oculus Rift be a, you look around and that's it. So uh, the final implementation of the Oculus Rift, well, um, you know, first of all, the head of your avatar will be disconnected um, from the animations that you have uh, typically. Like if you were normally running around when we get into a, a, a ship, for instance, the head position is controlled by the animation of the character climbing into it. Whereas when Oculus Rift is running, the head position is going to be tr controlled and tracked by the actual head position tracked off the Oculus Rift. Um, and then we're going to use the Oculus Rift to, you know, like basically looking around and wherever you're looking um, uh, will sort of inform of things you can select and do stuff like that. So playing it with the Oculus Rift will be, um, I think, fairly intuitive. Um, so we're definitely, you know, it's not just going to be tacked on. It's going to be, there is some specific changes in the code to work best with um, Oculus Rift or other um, headsets similar to Oculus Rift. Um, okay, next. All right, you VR lovers out there, I'm a VR lover. Um, some of you remember the <laughs> early, early days, there were people who actually worked out getting the Oculus to work uh, in Star Citizen, particularly in Arena Commander. They were really using it in the air a lot. Looked really amazing from my understanding. I remember hooking mine up one time and getting it to work, and it was amazing to see what it looked like. And this is when the game did not look all that great. It was amazing. Any of you who've played Elite Dangerous know that when you go into VR, once you've done it in VR, it's almost hard to go back to playing it normally on a screen. Um, CIG just recently, one of their devs just recently posted that that is something that they still want to do and that this person, this particular dev in particular, is really interested in doing it. Uh, but it's not on the table yet. It's it's down the road. It's not a priority issue. Um, if they do do it, great. If they don't, I'm still cool with it. Um, a lot of us have a lot of different things like Tobies and a lot of other devices to help us get that feeling uh, of immersion. Uh, but obviously back then, so 11 years ago, they were definitely talking about it and thinking about it. Here we go. Next question comes from Vidi, who asks, question about inertia. If a carrier crashes into a large object, will any ships it carries be thrown about the deck, especially ships that have been de-anchored and are on the flight deck about to launch? Yes, we are going to simulate. So basically, if a ship that has crew aboard or unattached items aboard gets um, like a big impact, explosion outside, um, you know, someone crashes into it, uh, what we will do is we will actually um, generate an impulse for these sort of unfastened or unattached objects inside. So you know, the the ultimate goal is like you get a big hit on a bigger ship, multi-crewed ship, and the ship lurches like you see in Star Wars or Star Trek or something, and you know everybody sort of lurches on the deck. And uh, so that's a, that's a big goal. Um, so it should uh, be uh, 
Um, pretty cool when we get it working, but that's actually one of the goals of the bigger ships and the cap ships and the multi uh, uh, cruise ships. Um, I, you know, curious to what you guys think about this, the force reactions thing. We have it on the ships now. Um, I don't mind the force reaction when it comes to us as players, right? First of all, it forces us to use the tools that are there, like sit down, right? Sit in, <laughs> sit in the chair, sit on the stool, sit on the bed, lay down, whatever the case may be, which is great because otherwise people just stand around and all this stuff is there and nobody sits down. So I love the fact that you literally have to sit down when you're flying. What I don't know I like is, and this isn't on every ship, but I was in my C8R last night. I've been in the links before. And you guys know that in those ships, the CAR has the bottles of water and juice and all that stuff down there. And in the, the links, it's got some drinks and things in it. And when you hit bumps on the road, or if you spin too hard, those items in there all fall. They all fall over. I mean, it's, that's the realism side of this, right? Because if your ship gets hit hard enough or your vehicle hits a rough road, those items detach. They, they fall over. I spent almost 10 minutes reorganizing my medicine cabinet in the C8R when I got out last night because everything was flipped over, turned over inside of it and everything. That's the OCD in me, okay? I, I had to do it. I had to fix it. Um, you know, do you want your ships to do that? I mean, like literally, if you're in your carrick and you get hit hard uh, and your drinks and stuff, I mean, maybe if it's in the refrigerator, it won't happen. But if you've got stuff on the counter, that stuff flies off and falls on the floor like when you walk around, like, you know, <laughs> when you walk around Hearst and Lorville. Um, you know, is that something that you want? All the stuff laying around on the floor? Do you want it to stay attached? You know, it, it, how far do you want the immersion and the realism to go, basically? All right, here we go. Okay, next question comes from Hakase, who asks, I think it's Hakase, H-A-K-A-S-E, but Hakase, maybe? I don't know. Uh, question, what if someone failed to board my ship? Can I keep theirs as they are all dead trying to take mine? Or will that still be considered as stolen? I think it's a great question, and my instinct is that um, if someone tries to board your ship and capture yours and you kill them in the process, then yes, um, you are fully okay with having their ship and it will not be considered as stolen, uh, mm. whether um, you know, you've got CCDs that prove that you're acting in self-defense or whatever, but I definitely think that should be a penalty if you're trying to raid someone, you potentially could lose your ship if you uh, die. Um, so answer is yes there. All right. Last question. I don't know how they're going to pull that off. I mean, I like the idea. Don't get me wrong. You try to take my ship and uh, you fail. I can take your ship now. I mean, I, I can't fly two ships, obviously. But let's just say that you um, you came after me in your Cuddy Black and uh, somewhere or other uh, you tried to board me and your people and I, I killed everybody or my crew killed everybody. Um your ship's out there floating. The question for me becomes, first of all, how do I get it? Do I let one of my other crew, assuming I have a crew with me, maybe that crew member can now fly your ship. Uh, I wonder if it detects that you're dead. Maybe that's what happens. If it detects that the owner has died, then the game now, the ship now becomes, you know, no owner over that ship. Now, if the owner comes back, let's just say I don't take a ship. Let's say we leave, leave their ship out there. The ship, the person responds, they come back, their ship is disabled, or if it's still, they get back in it, the ownership automatically goes back to them, right? Um, or maybe the, yeah, maybe that's the only way I can think of it happening because something has to trigger it. Um, but if, uh, if my crew member goes over there and you died, my crew member, maybe, I, maybe there's a window, maybe there's a one minute window where that ship is available. And if my crew member gets in there and occupies that ship or starts it up, the ownership transfers to them. But even then, there's so much tied to that, right? Because now your ship's been taken by somebody else and now you want to claim it. If the ownership is now transferred to that new person, claiming it means nothing. So now you have to put in an insurance claim and get a brand new ship. Maybe that's the way it would work. I don't know what you guys think. I I'm really curious as to how they could work around that. That is a interesting piece uh you won't lose ownership because of insurance no that's not true prisoner because ownership just like if somebody steals my car right in real life that car is gone right it's gone the insurance company has to replace it with a new one so they could they could do that um they could make it work right 
if you file a claim. Yes, you, that's what I mean. Yeah, you'd have to file. If you file a claim, you lose ownership of that other ship. It's interesting. Oh, well, they'll, 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 I'm sure they'll come up with something. But um, the idea that the ship, you don't take a crime stat for taking somebody else's ship and you can keep it. Starfield's got that, right? You, you, if you kill the NPCs or whoever, you get to keep their ship. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they work that out. Okay. All right. We're on the last question here. From Beer for the Beer God. So maybe appropriate for the last question. Um, the retaliated pictures included a concept of the bomb bay loaded with a retractable beam gun. Later on, I heard that beam weapons wouldn't be included in the game because you're not a fan of them. Will there be beam weapons in Star Citizen? And if not, why don't you like them? <laughs> mm. um, no, I, I don't dislike beam weapons. I mean, I like the Star Wars sort of laser bolt stuff uh, because that's generally, I sort of grew up seeing a lot of that in sci-fi. So we're, obviously we have that in Star Citizen. Uh, but we're probably going to have some uh, bigger um, beam weapons, not necessarily on a fighter craft, but on a big capital ship stuff. We'd be talking about having that maybe on a spinal mount or maybe a really big ship-to-ship -ship, um, turret stuff. So um, we will, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have some beam weapons, but they'll be more for sort of slow moving, you know, like whether it's cutting, a, you know, cutting into a hull or something like that. Um, but uh, it won't be a sort of fighter-based. Um, that'll be more sort of the traditional Star Wars um, side. All right. Okay, so that's now, the that's uh, end of uh, this episode. That's the interesting thing because the tachyons, if you guys remember the tachyon cannons, that were on the uh, Banu Defender. I think those are beam weapons. They're not pulse. And those things hit you instantaneously. Now they pulled them out because they were, <laughs> they were, they were pretty good when they were, when they were in the game, they've taken them out. I actually like that because it's Banu. Now it's unique to Banu. And I don't think if, they, if you're going to have it to me, that's the way to me, I think that a ship like that, like an alien ship or something, if they've got like a beam weapon, that's fine. I have no problem with them having it. That makes it unique. It makes it alien and that the human ships cannot have it. I don't think you should be able to take the tachyon that is known for being on the Banu ships and being able to put it on a Hornet. I, I, I wouldn't want that. Um, I think it also gives an edge to those who buy alien ships if they choose to get those because they pay a little bit more for them. That's one of the things that they get. That's one of the bonuses uh, that they get for that type of ship. But uh, anyway, I don't know. That's uh, that's me. Yeah, he mentions about the beams for like the laser cutters and stuff like that. And people have been joking around about the tractor beam that in fact, people have been complaining that there's too many beams in the game already, right? But here it's in reference to it being a weapon. Uh, so that's the name uh, of that. We'll answer okay. 10 questions. Again, thank you for listening. Uh, and thank you to the subscribers out there for um, subscribing. And thank you to all the backers out there for backing um, Star Citizen and enabling <laughs> us to make this down. incredibly ambitious, um, but um, what I think is going to be a, 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 like a super awesome uh, and fun experience. Um, so thank you all. And uh, I will catch you next week. Thank you, Chris. All righty. That's that for 10 for the chairman for this week. Um, yeah, some good stuff there. Hopefully you guys uh, garnered some cool things. Um, uh, maybe I'll go back to the other page because I think you want to chat. I hope I didn't lose chat. Did I lose it? Oh, I did. I'll leave it there because I don't want to lose you guys chat. You can see what each other's saying. Um, yeah, we, we covered uh, three episodes again this week's episodes uh, six, seven and eight. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, each week on Tuesdays, we're going to go through these to get people uh, flat. If you, if you remember seeing these episodes, it'll be a refresher. But a lot of people have never seen the 10 for the chairman. So you're really getting to hear Chris's vision for the game. You're getting to hear questions that came from the community. A lot of questions that people even ask to this day. Um, you're getting them answered. They were already asked before, basically, is what I'm telling you. 11 years ago, 10 years ago, people were already asking many of these questions. So. Hopefully uh, there'll be something there that you guys um, learn from it from today. And you guys put in some great stuff in the chat. Uh, I'm kind of reading some of the comments here that you guys have. Okay. Yeah, good stuff. Good, good stuff. Um, okay. Let's see here. Uh, bear with me here. I'm going to 
get us set up to do a little raidy raid here. Um, let's see what this other question was here. Da, 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 okay, yeah. Uh, in fact, I paid 250 for the Idris beam weapon that replaces the main gun. Yeah, yeah, for the kit. Yeah, now that's got a beam for sure, right? No, actually, that's not a beam weapon, is it? On the Idris, that thing shoots like a pulse. Am I, am I wrong, guys, on the Idris? I thought it was more like a pulse thing that fires versus like a one solid beam strike. I think it's both. I can't remember now. That rail gun, I, I can't remember. I thought, it, I thought it fired a projectile. At least that's what I thought. I thought it was an energy projectile that it fired. It's just that it's super fast when it comes out. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. One variant does one thing, the other does another. I don't know. You got me on that one, buddy. All right. Well, anyway, those of you who are Idris fans out there, you know what that ship does. I don't remember completely how that thing worked out. The K replaces it with a beam. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, listen, we're going to do a raid over with Space Cutlet. Uh, thank you guys, as always, for being here today. Feel free to tell people, share, let people know that I'm on Tuesdays and Thursdays at midday, right at 12 noon. I got on today right at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you guys for all the great comments and stuff and that uh, everything that you shared in chat. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys will have a really, 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 really great day today. Uh, we're going to send you over to Space Cutlet. When you get over there, give them a shout. Let them know that you came over from Griff Gaming. And as always, peace, love, and soul. Take care of yourselves, gang. Be good. We'll see you soon.